how are you all doing? <laughs> oh. Hello. Hello, Black One Microsoft. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing today? I know I normally go through and say hello to everyone, but I, I will do. But I first wanted to do that. Yeah, this. So, the patron vote is live. And the patron vote being live means, well, hey, I've put up a nice picture of a Blackburn shark. I thought that was quite a cool one to have up there. And then the carrier slide. And there's also the admiral slide from the US um, carrier raid to 1942. And then we have the votes. Now, we have... A very significant range. We even have our first sub question, which honestly, patron didn't like putting in, but I put it in. Okay, uh, which is Felix, uh, as with Carl H, but carry commissioned early enough, and Valakrib is a base in the Indian Ocean. The reason why I had to change it, Felix, was because if the uh, can I if. The Italians commissioned a carry in 1941. There was no way it was getting through to the Indian Ocean. Because it would have to go through the Suez Canal or have to go out, out the Straits of Gibraltar. In which case, it would be going around down the South Atlantic, around Africa. That's not a good scenario for it in any way, shape, or form. And going through the Suez Canal is just giving the Royal Navy a new carrier, which the Royal Navy would have used. The Royal Navy would have used, even if they had to rip out its system and fix it so it could be used. Um, okay, we've got lots of alternate history video uh, requests. We've got uh, truth behind Western ships versus Chinese junks. As Nick G says, there's a lot of various misinformation discussion out there, which is always interesting to get into. And Runan's potted history of the Britain's Commonwealth greatest weapon, the Black Garden Shed, which I always secretly w hope won't get through, because despite it being interesting, Runon, the sheer scope of trying to work out how many things are actually related. Every time you suggest this, I have gone and done some research, and I just find keep finding more and more things which you can link to a garden shed of sorts. The trouble is, some of those garden sheds are rather large. Some of them are spaces like my own, my own glorious little office here. Some of them are rather cavernous abodes which look closer to i don't know multi-story stables and some of the things that get built on them are interesting but that the sheer scope of that means that i will probably end up upsetting more people than i'll make happy because of the things i won't include because there's only so many hours in a day We've got Michael 66, Alternate History, Admiral Henderson on his on an inspection tour when he finds four pristine 1910 town class. What does he do? I think has a little party because he can do some of those. Uh, there's been a few interesting discussions and a few interesting questions. There was even one thing put forward where basically you got the same number of carriers as you did capital ships, which I didn't consider putting in this week. But literally, I ran out. As I have written up here, I had 35 submitted. So I picked the 25. Basically, I went through and everyone who'd submitted one question got one in. Then most of people who submitted two got their second one in. And a couple of people got their third one in. If anyone's worrying about the news today, which is, of course, Queen Elizabeth having... Atrius Queen Elizabeth having her propellers be an issue. Let's be honest, that's not a surprise. Things happen. Ships being used, they crop up problems. And frankly, at the moment, we're trying to keep them as high a maintenance level as possible. So that if there's a war comes, they're going to be ready for that. So the thing is, why say it's kind of like the scenario where in nineteen in Taranto, they kept Eagle going, even though she had minor issues. Because there was a war on, they kept her going, kept her going, kept her going, until she couldn't go anymore, and then she wasn't available for Taranto. Well, the lesson is, fix miners while you can, and hopefully, therefore, you will have the thing available for when you really need it. Because, let's be honest, some of those operations which Eagle takes part in, she's really not needed. She'd been fixed and been available at Taranto, and you had a second carrier force at Taranto, you could have doubled the strike group at Taranto. If you double the strike group at Toronto, what does it, what are the consequences further on down the line? So, 
you know, there's very sensible reasons for why Queen Elizabeth is having the time she is having. We also have the issues that Queen Elizabeth, of course, remember, if you go back further, had to have her own time in dry dock abridged, let's say, because Prince of Wales was a crop up. This is the problem when you only have two hulls, okay, to do the job. You're putting them under a lot of pressure, especially when they're the centerpiece of your force. And by centerpiece, I don't mean a glorious, you know, thing looking like, uh, you know, that looks in the middle and looks, looks lovely, but doesn't really do anything. No, I mean the functional centerpiece, the hub that your entire force operates around. So therefore, yes, um, there are going to be issues. There are going to be times like this, but we all told them there would be because they only got two. They paid for three and a half, took delivery of two. Ooh, we have sci-fi versus modern carriers. We have Blackman Maximus one, which I think is probably one of the more one of the really interesting ones, despite it ending up down there. Because what happens is I then randomly reorganise them pretty much using the joy of it, uh, joy of his Excel spreadsheet. Um, and remnants of Germany doesn't scuttle its navy after World War One. What is the impact of the aftermath of war? That's a really interesting one. Also, though, strange enough. Despite me mixing them up and trying to keep them all separate, I didn't found when I was putting them in that Paul from Chicago had both ended up next to each other. And there were some other ones which were very similar to this, so I chose Paul's one, because he'd only submitted two, whereas others had submitted more. Um, da -da -da -da. We have SAM development, I uh, service air missiles. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool one. And this up here also is um, from Black Maximus. We have Zeros in the Mediterranean. Blackman Maximus has submitted a lot of good ones this month. I mean, really, a lot of good ones. And this is Michael 66. The Stalin at the London Treaty. Now, that's an amazing. Stalin turning up in 1930 London Treaty. Oh, my lord, the ructions of that create. I mean, literally. It sets back Plan Z. Massively. Because the way it's going to build up. Is Stalin going to accept to be the same level as France and Italy? Is Stalin going to be an armament of the same level as Japan? If Stalin demands to be the same level as Japan, is Japan going to accept it? It's just, it's just an absolute powder keg. And eventually, what you find is almost required, almost becomes a requirement. Is that either you have to have a treaty where Stalin agrees that his fleet, he will not join up, his Pacific and his his Atlantic fleets will never join. Which, of course, no one's going to have face in, especially not the Japanese, so it's not that wouldn't work. Or you end up entering in a new tier, which is you have a four tier system rather than a three tier system, and you have Britain and America, Japan, Russia, and then France and Italy. But the trouble is, the only way you can have make space, because France and Italy won't go down below what they are. Because they can't afford to. The only way you can have space is if you push Japan up to get Russia in. And then if you push Japan up, Britain and America are going to have you pushed up. It's just... It's wondrous what that does. It's just... It's... <laughs> fun. Anyway, there are seven days to vote and I hope you'll enjoy that. So... Let's get rid of that one. There we go, back to full. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? How is everyone going? Da da ding. So, we have Jacob. Hello. Hello, Paul. Hello, Michael Gooch. Hello, Team Looker. Hatashi Vachel. Hello, Paul Lemus. Hello, Tanner Verka. Hello, Runon. Hello, Bob Fry. Hello. De Brock, hello Blackman Maximus, hello Stephen Richards, hello Dave Harrison, hello Carl von Gasberg, hello Night 6831, hello Stephen Richards, Captain Seaforth, hello, hello everyone, hello Mike Gooch, hello George Newman, hello Leslie Mitchell, hello Constant Drowsiness, hello DG40, hello Joss Funk, hello HMS Ford, Mark Harkness, hello, hello HMS Ferdinand, hello Jacob, W5570. Hello, everyone who's watching. Albert Zasky, hello. Hello, all. How are we doing this evening? Are we having a good Sunday? Hello, Duke of Petchington. So, what have we got on questions? And today, I've literally have said is today is going to be random 
naval history books, and I've got a completely randomized set of books I'm looking at. And I've got, as always, there's a link to below, uh, below down to the competition where you can win if I take the camera with me. Yeah, da 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 da. -da. Books above my head. Thank you, look. No hands. Camera's coming with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to improve when I have an office which has the ability to have a kitchen and various other things. I'm, I might actually be able to do some of my presentations walking and talking. I might even set up a green screen in a new place. Just imagine that. A gr me with a green screen. Imagine the fun I'm going to have with that. Especially if I can get it going full, what I would call weather person. Mainly because it's been drummed into me um, to do that. If I, I did sort of a weather presenter, full green screen, imagine me with one of that, with, you know, ship's plans and operational plans up next to me and me dancing around them and going, well, we have this down here and then they do this to get down here and it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Oh, good lord. <coughs> Team Locker, I just saw your question. Should the Royal Navy have looked at the, to the pocket battleship design and have some of their own? Why? Let me explain why. That, that, that's not even facetious. facetious. You see, the Germans build a of bat pocket battleships because they don't have their own battleships. And because they can't really build capital ships. They can't build full-size capital ships. They're not allowed to by treaty and various other things. But Britain can build full-size capital ships. So the thing is, if you have full-size capital ships, which can do the whole actual capital ship work and all those things better than the Deutschland class can, and if you consider the British are looking at a 9.2-inch gun heavy cruiser, then let's be honest, the 11 inches isn't much of an advantage over that in ter because of the rate of fire on 9.2-inch and its realistic operational capabilities. There's no need for a pocket battleship for those heavy cruisers. And let's be honest, the Deutschland class are heavy cruisers. Nice to Should the Brewster SB2A Buccaneer Scout Bomber have come much earlier than 1941? Well, it would be nice to have it earlier than 1941, but it wasn't available before then. And think about this. You've asked the question, should it come? Well, it would be nice to have it. But these things tend to come at the time they do. Once they've finished, they've gone through tra testing, training... And all the things that they need to to actually get operational. You couldn't get it in earlier than that. So that's when it came. It seems like, are you building a virtual lecture theater then? I have plans. I have plans. I, I'm not sure if I have the money for such things. But I do have quite a lot of DIY skills. And I'm going to have... I would say in terms of space, I'm going to end up with an office which is about three to four times the actual space of this place, the realistic space of this place, because it's going to be a lot more usable space. And there's also going to be things in there which it doesn't have in here. If that makes sense. In here has to have space taken up by all sorts of useful things, but things which I need to operate out here which I wouldn't necessarily need in a build-up building. Um, it's things like there's my fridge here, which is lovely. But I, it's my office, the plan is for my office to back onto my kitchen. And my kitchen to, is, on, is going to be behind it, basically, in the same thing, in the same room, but there's going to be an island and things separating it. In which case, the odds are the fridge ends up either in the kitchen or ends up maybe upstairs in you know my bedroom or lounge area which is the lounge second bedroom area um that, that's the reality it's so there's things which i have out here because i don't have access to them in i guess they're so they're in the house that i will have in there so things will change around and it makes it interesting it should be fun and i'm planning on using that space for those things Found these videos from a cat cafe in Japan where cats knock over model trains. Are they supposed to be relaxing? No, infuriating. That's for people who like... That's sort of very, very... Um, how do I put this in a way which is friendly to my cousins? There are people who get... Uh, who like... Who enjoy the experience of being frustrated and being put down 
and generally being emotionally hurt. Those are there are people like that in the world, and I, I can only presume anyone who want to, wants to watch cats knocking over trains fits into that category. Um, if Australia and New Zealand merge as one United Dominion versus being separate, what does Oceania's larger navy look like in history and today? Well, seeing as they probably have similar politicians to the US today, probably not too much different, but it's probably going to be slightly bigger. It's going to be slightly bigger because they're going to have even more space to cover. I mean, literally, they're going to have more, even more of an area to cover. So basically, you add the forces together for most of the period, and you probably still would roughly today. Uh, Duke of Petchington, remember, little cousins are watching. I'm not, I'm not going to say the words out loud. I'm hoping they're not seeing the chat. They're not seeing the chat. The chat's not up on the screen, and I hope they're not watching. The, they're not seeing the chat. So just. Yeah, little cousins watching. At least till ten o'clock. Try and keep those words out, and remember the cousins watch on catch up. I love. I, I I can understand where you're coming from. I know the words. I'm not using them. I don't want to have to explain them to a six-year-old. <laughs> Jacob, I've been out of Luke for a while, but it sounds like you have. You guys found a house. Yes, we have. And put a bit in it. And, yeah. Thanks, Duke of Etchington. <laughs> Thank you for understanding. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Assuming they merged back in the 1910s? Oh, pretty much. You would have a fairly decent force of cruisers. And I think to this day... You probably have things like, I can't imagine the Canberra class being just two vessels. Because you suddenly have that much more to cover. Why am I so quiet? I have no idea. My, all, the app, all the things are telling me I'm great and noisy. So, um... I have no idea why I'd be quiet. If I am quiet, everyone please tell me. I'll put it in the chat. It's not supposed to be quiet. I haven't got any reductions going on the mic at all. And this has not been played around with at all. So, um, yeah, I have no idea. Right. Uh, Runon, if Germany got a set of IJN carrier plans, how do we get the Graf Sersen? Just how? Look, I've been over in the past what sort of carrier time period um, they'd be needing to look at. What sort of carrier design. And... Honestly, once you look at their aircraft carriers and look at them and go, when are they coming in service? What are they doing? You are probably looking at Ryujo or Soryu. Now, Ryujo is the is a terrible design, so you hope they go for Soryu. Soryu would actually be a very decent carrier. It's 16,200 tons in standard. It's 19,100 tons in normal. It's a very decent, very capable vessel. It can carry quite a significant air group. Roughly 63 plus 9 reserve is the official. So, so that's a fairly... That's 72 aircraft. That's a good... Set for 34 knots top speed, um, range of seven and a half, 7,750 nautical miles at 18 knots. Honestly, the Germans could not go far wrong with that design. I guarantee they could go wrong with that design, but if they got that design in, well, let's be honest, it is laid down in 1934, it's launched in 1935, so the design. It's going to be stabilised somewhere around April 1934. If they get it in April 1934, and they order it as soon as Sharnost and Nisenau are launched, and they have one of them being built from on the yards, there, or maybe alongside, they could, which they could probably do with that one, they could well have a carrying service by 1939. I just doubt they would, because that would be sensible and would require them going on um, operating for uh, them, sort of going for things.
Come on, a tad more volume needed <laughs> because they're like trying to listen to this live. Uh, ads will blow my eardrums. I, I, I'm speaking as if you notice you're me shouting at the ca at the microphone. I'm I'm going as loud as I can. I ran a video through Boost twice a few weeks ago. Hey, caramba. Hmm. Let's see. Is that any working? Da -da 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 yep, it's all good. Uh, I can actually. What I will do. I will do something nice for you. All. I will boost up the output. And you can tell me how bad it is. Whether it goes too loud or it sounds right. <sighs> so, just how do they get the grass up? Well, basically if they go and build a Soryu-based design, they could have a decent carrying service by, by 1939. The problem becomes for the Japanese, for the Germans, and the same problem becomes for the Italians, okay? If the Germans are building an aircraft carrier, or the Italians are building a carrier, the Royal Navy is going to respond. If the Germans are building a carrier and starting in the 1934-35 period, that response is going to be a second Ark Royal. Because again... Whilst theoretically it's not going to, if we consider the 1936 treaty, because the uh, because the Japanese pullout doesn't have, in theory, cumulative limits, it does have in practice cumulative limits, but doesn't have in theory, the British can quite easily go, we need to build an extra carrier. But also the British can go, escalator clause, we need an extra carrier. There are lots of options available for the British to go, we need an extra carrier. It's the same with the Italians. If the Italians are going to have a carrier available by 1941, you would expect, A, the illustrious class to be under construction a little bit more, but also when Churchill goes, I'd like to pause carrier construction, they turn around and go, Italians, carrier, Mediterranean. Okay, we need them. And that probably wouldn't pause... I. It, we might try and pause everyone after the armoured carriers, but honestly, if you don't pause the armoured carriers, and if you maybe get unicorn tacked through as well, then life becomes a little bit easier. Life becomes a little bit easier earlier in the war, and who knows what happens. Now, super question, when will the MOD develop the intercontinental ballistic naffy? Oh, good lord, we can always hope for those days. Uh, nice one. Why did anyone think the Brewster, SP2, Buckingham, Vault, SP2, Vindicator were good ideas? They were garbage. They weren't garbage in their time or when they were being developed. They were quickly outpaced by events and the reality of development, technological development, but they weren't garbage when they were started or when they were working on. And frankly, they were what was available. Again, I've said this before, you have to remember, procurement starts for... Well, let's put it this way. The first specifications could be three to four years before the aircraft actually enter service. Swordfish, 9th spec to 1933, end of service 1936. I always talk, usually talk about it being a 1933 aircraft, because when you're spec when an aircraft is spec that's when it starts to define it. Okay? So, when you're looking at the Buccaneer and the Vindicator, when are they spec Do they make sense when they're spec They do, yes. They're not bad aircraft. The thing is, though, everyone gets a vote. It's kind of like... The Royal Navy, quite a lot of people come sort of thought about naval aviation. They come, their response was, well, you know, they didn't have a fighter. And I go, well, they wanted a fighter. They had plans for getting a fighter. It's just World War II happened. 
and the RAF went, ah! Mainly because the Air Ministry for years had been going, no, the bomber will always get through, so there's no point investing in fighters. And the rest of the RAF was going, we quite like fighters. We quite like fighters. Look at what the fleet air arm and the Navy is doing with fighters. The Navy really quite likes fighters. We'd quite like some fighters. We'd quite like some... And eventually, by about 1937, after the Inskip Ward, someone from Fighter Command finally gets some sort of bat over an officer in the Air Ministry and is going, you will authorize fighter production. And then they have a full-on panic. And that's why the Royal Navy doesn't get their fighters in 1940. Because the RAF has a panic in 1939 because they hadn't only started ordering fighters properly in 1937 after skipping them for about six, seven years. It's fun. So trying to avoid news given it's taking a toll on my mental health as it causes anxiety. But my city has seven boards in the city that show to make news. Any tips to avoid? Good lord. Um... <clears throat> Headphones and sunglass and sunglass uh, and shades which cover your eyes or uh, hats which will stop you being able. To, uh, that means you don't get to look up as much. And just keep going, keep in your own world. But that's not really particularly safe. My my main example of the plan is to move to Cornwall. Um, and, you know, just have a slightly more peaceful life down there. Robert Leonard, fraud or United Ocean replace, uh, United Oceana scenario? Assume they decided to go ahead with a replacement for the HMS Melbourne Invincible deal. is scrapped. After the Invincible deal is scrapped. Um... Well, if they're not going to get Invincible, they might well order those still. The Invincible class still has merit, and let's be honest, they're the cheapest carriers going that they can get and operate. So, honestly, the Australians probably join the Sea Harrier program and get their own baby carriers. Because, let's be honest, their other option is to go to the Americans for baby carriers at that point, which are the LHAs. And they are huge, crew-intensive monsters. So your choice is go Sea Harrier... Uh, go uh, go invincible, cl invincible class, or go expensive, and they're going to go invincibles. All right, let's see if we can catch up with some of the questions. Once I catch up with the questions, I'll do a book. That's the plan. Mark Harness asked before, but not sure answered. USN listens to Doctor C and puts the eight-inch guns on the console on the escort cruisers instead of Lexington and Saratoga. What do those two cruisers look like? Call them Brandywine class. Um, honestly, if they go for the four twin turrets, hang on, there is. let me just check, I think it's twin turrets, I'm not sure if it's good at moving or not, but I find it fun, it is four twin turrets, um, almost certainly you're going to get something which looks like an American version of a county class. You've got four twin turrets. Um, if we consider when these enter service, and like this, they do commission in 1927. And the USN cruiser are the class that's sort of commissioning at roughly the same time. Go through the whole list. Um, do, 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 uh, that is pretty much the Pensacola class. Now they have nine guns in three triple turrets, but the thing is, I think if you're going to Invest in something which is going to actually give you some sort of protection for your carriers. You're probably going to want something which is slightly slower, slightly more armoured. So you probably go for the um, four twins. But the interesting thing is, you might then continue it on and just build the Pensacola. Uh, uh, might, might build the two for the Pensacola class to the same standard as you just built the four, uh, the, the two for the um, Brandywine or whatever class. 
be interesting to see. But I do think it'd be something not too dissimilar to a county if you've got four twins. My turn. Uh, the Austrian government began considering requesting the United Kingdom and the United States to build a similar carrier capable of operating F-18 strike Hornet, Hornet strike fighters. Honestly, they're more likely to get the USN prepared to sell them one of their old carriers. That's more likely what they're to get. A midway class or something like that. Adapt it. Um, but again, it's that the crewing is so he heavy. The Robert then you have to remember the American crewing is massively different to everyone else's crewing, and it has been. It took a started to diverge from World War Two onwards. Um, the British and French led the way, but various other powers have led the way in pushing for pushing crew numbers down. Um, basically, to have. Let uh, have the systems made to assist a crew, so the crew don't need a. Uh, you know, one of the classic examples I give is the Zumwalt class has one of the most advanced boat handling systems ever put in a ship, and yet the U.S. Navy insists on crewing them as if those boat systems are still entirely manually operated, and as if they need to, need to have a crew to, to manually operate all of them at the same time. And whilst there might be a circumstance where that's the case, it's very unlikely for all the systems to go wrong, and for you need to be there, and for you therefore need to be crewing all of them, unless you're dealing with horrific damage, in which case you're probably not crewing the boats, but crewing the life rafts, in which case you wouldn't be doing it. Johnny Kick, asked before, but I'm not sure I answer. Do you plan a key ships lecture for um, F class battlecruisers? Do you think they've covered sufficiently in your Nelson class lecture? I think they're probably covered sufficiently in that one because they were part of that development process. And honestly, the Fs weren't as well developed as, in many ways, the Gs were. So the Gs and N Ns, uh, Gs and Ns got their own thing, but the um, S haven't so far. But that depends. If there's a whole, if there's a whole slew of essays on the F class, then I'll probably do it. Just to make sure everyone's got a good back a back point for where they are, what they are. Um, let's see. Answer that one. Steve Richards. HMS Furious and her sisters. Did the lower flying off deck never come obsolete? Obviously, it did become obsolete. But basically, the as I said when I was talking about it, when it was originally put in, the idea that you could launch fighters quickly to deal with the situation whilst um, still arraigning and launching a strike or recovering a strike. So basically, it's an early idea of, you know, what we have or have today with uh, angled flight decks. And it works for a while until fighters get too big to use it. At which point, you move past it. And it becomes, honestly, really an anti-air anti -air defense net. Anti-aircraft net. Nest. With all sorts of weapons put in it. That's it. Why did the Royal Navy reject the Brewster bu uh, Buccaneer? Because they didn't want that at that time. It wasn't fitting with the models or requirements they had. Think about the fights the Royal Navy was waging at that time. Where does the Buccaneer fit in them? Think, where does the Buccaneer help out? What is the Royal Navy doing that the Buccaneer is more useful in that role than what they already have for that role? Uh, nice and would it be correct to think that it was the Battle of Britain that turned the Brits off Diamond Nope. The Brits still retained dive bomber capability on a lot of aircraft throughout World War II. It's just they didn't have a specific dive bomber because, honestly, they'd seen what happened to them, but they also they were providing support in different ways. The British preferred rockets. The British preferred lots of other systems than dive bombing. Stafford Johnson, to help save on design costs, the Ronnie partnered with the US on Burks. What did the iron version look like? 
it would not work. Again, the RN crewing system versus the US crewing system. The Royal Navy wouldn't crew a bug. If you consider... Let's consider this. Okay. Okay. So the Arleigh Burke class, they require a crew of... A complement of roughly 300 and... Well, between... Let's go for flight 2A, because that fits up more with the British, uh, British procurement time. You've got roughly 330. A British Type 45 destroyer has a crew of 191. So, think about that. 330 versus roughly 190. If we consider that was preceded by the Type 42, which had a crew of 270. Which slowly went down to 250 over time. So, the British are always significantly less crew than their American ones. So, basically, what you would get is if the British were involved, the British would probably want a British radar system in. In which case, you would probably have an interesting discussion over what radar system you use. Uh, then you have the whole discussion over missiles. Again, the British might want a British missile system, but most of the British missiles can use the Mark 41 VLS, so probably Mark 41 VLS. Maybe a combined command system, some sort of version of Aegis which can work with the British radar system as well as the British missiles as well as the American ones. And possibly both would end up, the types would end up with a 5 inch gun. Uh, you probably end up with about the same firepower mix that you have on a Burke, but the British would be a very different hull. And honestly, you probably see what happened with the Horizon Frigate Project. And it's often misunderstood exactly what happened to the Horizon Frigate Project. But you have to remember, the Horizon Frigate Project is the idea of putting an air warfare frigate together that was going to be the equivalent of Type 45, all those sort of things, for Britain, France, and Italy. And the fundamental problem becomes when you look at the the frigates which come out of the Horizon Frigate Project for Italy and for France versus what Britain ends up building in Type 45, you realise very quickly Britain wanted something a bit bigger and a bit different, a bit more we have the Falklands and we might need to do it again someday so we will make sure we're ready for it. Versus the other two, which are some very good frigates, but are ultimately air defense frigates rather than destroyers. So as good as the Horizon frigates are, they're not a Type 45. And the Type 40, the difference between Type 45 and the Burke is mainly the Burke has a huge, far bigger VLS depth, which does give it a lot of strength. But also it carries a lot more crew. Now, there are advantages of carrying crew for damage control and things like that, which I will accede to. But the fact is, for Britain, if you take the British Type 45 of 190-odd crew and the American Arleigh Burke of 330, that's a difference of 140 personnel. Times that by 6, that's a difference of... 840. Now, then roughly double that because of people ashore and various other things going through training. You That's talking 1,680. And suddenly that's a significant number of personnel who wouldn't be able to be elsewhere in the Royal Navy. You'd have to have a bigger Royal Navy, bigger personnel bill, or you might not get, get as many ships because that's the way British government's played the game for years, you know, you know internally within itself. So, that's the problem. It wouldn't really help. Mm. 
Now, I think I've answered that one. Answered that one. Done that one. Done that one. Um, what happens if the USN had the funds to develop a night carrier doctrine on part of Britain by 1941? Oh, good lord. Then their carriers could do all sorts of nasty things. But also, it could fundamentally change midway. Because that could very quickly be turned into a night strike, depending on the movements of the aircraft. But that's also going to also going to have an impact on how the British are pursuing it, and that's going to cause fun. Uh, because let's put it this way: if the British can tell the Americans are pushing for it, then the British need for a fighter, especially a night fighter that can defend their fleet against night attacks, is going to be is it high? Because they're going to presume if the Americans are going down that route, the Japanese are also going to go down that route. So pretty much. And that's the other thing, because if the British and the Americans are both pursuing that route, at some point the Japanese are going to come on to it and they're going to be pushing for that route as well. So it's going to change some of the conundrums and might actually might actually lead to a night fighter. If the Americans are pursuing it by 1941, they're going to start early in the 1930s. In which case you might have had a Royal Navy fighter project being run at the same time as part of the same program that produces the Albacore. In which case you could have a fighter available. Have you seen Hypothetical History's eight hour long video series on the Falklands War? He just finished. Nope. Thank you for all the super chats, by the way, Robert. It's very nice of you. <laughs> oh. Considering I'm just about to be moving house and all sorts of things, and I've had my first ever speeding ticket come through, or rather no. In the UK system, I had a note come through going, was this you? If so, please confirm. Okay, I went online, confirmed. They said, we will get back in contact with you in two within two weeks with the details of your fi uh, of, of your um, fine things and it, how you submit your what you did. And I'm sort of going, so I've just confirmed to you that I'm doing this. And instead of letting me carry this on immediately now online, I have to do wait two weeks. And I will hold on my hand up I was doing 50 and a 40. I thought it was a 50. It was on an A road which runs through Exeter. And I went round a corner and there was a man in a van with his camera and he spotted me and I got a ticket. And the ticket arrived today in the post, uh, post basically going, is it you? And I'm sort of going, yep, I did it. I was overtaking someone who was being annoying, they'd been weaving in the road, and so I'd gone to overtake them, thinking I could go up to 50, thinking it was 50. And I don't think, for some reason, I didn't check my sat-nav for its speed limits in the other area. So I was just pushing it, and yeah, I got caught. First ever speeding ticket. It happens. Danavilka, in your opinion, does the Battle Star configuration work as a carrier and how would you improve it? Uh, for a space carrier, it certainly does to my mind. Because it basically it gives it a multiple launch capability. Um, how would I improve it? Not really much you can do to improve it. Um... I would be tempted to say try and add on more hangars and more facilities onto the same hull, but I'm presuming you've, they've reached the limitation of what they can actually accommodate in the hull and support, so that's not really an option. Look, I, there is always the option, and in nice way, if I do get a speed away in this course, I will consider that my driving course for the year. Because I like to go on driving courses, and because, I, let's put it this way, I find it really strange. It's something you have to do re so regularly as driving, and so important as driving, considering you have something which you can hurt people seriously. You get qualified and could still be driving... 30 years later, and no one has checked your driving. 
and my mum, my grandfather, always had a policy of signing up to courses. They always wanted to do courses. They are always happy to do extra courses, off-road coursing or disc coursing. Or just going on a driving corner, of course, because going through the process of training, even if it's learning something, even if it's not learning for the sake uh, learning the skills that are normal for the road use it forces someone a someone's going to be looking at driving and it's going to hopefully comment on any bad habits you've managed to pick up that you haven't noticed and help you correct them but b it's going to make you think about your driving it's going to make you think through what you're doing driving and hopefully improve your driving so yeah that, if i end up on the speed awareness course i'll be happy to do it go for a speed awareness course It'll be interesting. It'll refresh my knowledge of the rules of the road. She useful to know. See, so, name a situation when you have got to speed. Um, I have to admit. You, pr I probably shouldn't have been, but I did think that. The thing is, I will say on this one that the, I thought the road speed limit was 50 on the road. So I was doing 50. And it is one of the things, they've got free photos of me, and I was doing 50 the whole time. So I was not going, I this is I will go 70, 80, 90. I thought it was a 50 road, and I was doing 50. Uh, and I was overtaking <laughs> someone who was weaving on the road. Uh, I would say occasionally, probably speeding is required to get out of certain situations. I have had fun with lorries, which are playing we want to overtake each other and do dodgems, and I have used the ability to put my foot down in the car to put a healthy distance between me and those lorries. And again, I I know what I'm doing. I, I realize I'm doing something which I'm not supposed to, but my view is it's safer than me being closer to those lorries. And my view is if I end up getting a speeding ticket for this, I will accept that because I've made a decision based on I don't want to be near those lorries because they're doing bad behaviour. And I realise bad, others' bad behaviour is never an excuse for your own bad behaviour. But sometimes it's a case of I'm picking the lesser of two evils. I don't want to risk being between these two lorries. Uh, because I don't know if you've ever been on it, but in the UK sometimes there is some fun. You've got the lorries which are supposed to be in the slow, in the slow lane trugging along and you over go to overtake them in the overtaking lane and not the outer overtaking lane just the second lane so it's a, it's a free lane motorway and i've had lorries pull out and try and go into the fast lane to overtake me overtaking the person in front of them and it's a case of oh friggin i'm getting out of here and i would say medical emergencies also do sort of count Mm. It's my first offence ever, I have to admit, that I've been caught. First offence ever on the speeding ticket. I'm sure the lorry drivers do look when they do it, but I'm not always sure they're actually good at doing it. Especially on some of the roads in the West Country where it's there it's really quite windy. It really is quite windy, so doing it is not necessarily a good idea. Not necessarily a good idea. Now, where were we? What were the term uh, in your ch well? No, that's that by Max Messers. What were the ter were the terms of the various treaties that limited German naval construction pre the abandonment of the treaties by Hitler? Uh, pretty much the treaty that limited 
everything. And Hitler never really abandoned the treaties. He just goes from the to the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. That's really what he's treating as his, his ban. Um, he's ignoring it, but that's what he's he's not really abandoning that. He's just ignoring that more than ever. Uh, the Anglo-German Naval Treaty fixed them at a certain percentage of the British fleet. And the Treaty of Versailles meant they couldn't have any ships greater than 10,000 tons and all sorts of things. Which is why you have the Deutschland class. Because basically it's to stop them getting battleships. Or anything dreadnought battleships. Seems like it's twice for me in 30 years of driving. Yeah. This is my first time, and I've been driving since... Well, this year will be my 19th year behind the wheel. And it's my first time speeding. Uh, well, I'd say being caught speeding. I, I, as said, there were there are instances, but there are few enough that I actually remember them. And then in my mind, I for all of them, it was a case of, I'm on a main road. I don't like the it's when uh, the, the, I never understand the people who go who are going 50 60 on a 30 mile per hour road that if you're with so in the UK if you're in a 30 mile per hour road that means you're in a pretty much built up area or there's a reason you're doing 30 you're supposed to do 30 miles an hour schools and things like that in which case don't and it just seems absurd to be going right and you know what I'm going to do 50 through here yeah even if you're doing it in the middle of the night, some drunk person might walk out or something like that. Just don't do it. But if you're on a motorway or a major A road in the middle of the night, Night 6841, question 5. If the USN could have cancelled the Brewster Buccaneer and Vought Vindicator, what could they get instead? Think about it, there's nothing really coming along. You're looking at, if you sort of the Vought Buccaneer. Uh, the Vought Vindicator, the Brewster, uh, Brewster Buccaneer. Um. Its first flight is 1941. They get it. They've got various other aircraft coming into service at the same time. They need those aircraft. You know? It's the... The British were less than happy with them, but, you know, they work. What do they get? They, some of them get adapted to night fighter roles, some of them get adapted to various operations. Um, the USN mainly used it for target tugs and for ground maintenance training. So they had the, you know, they what could they have done? The Australian government prefers Volti uh, Volti Vengeances, which are pretty cool aircraft. Let's be honest. Um, mainly, I have to say with the Brewster is the fact that it's available. That that's the trouble. It's kind of like the Volt. Um, it is the Vault Vindicator, isn't it? Yeah, Vault Vindicator. It's available. You know. <laughs> there aren't... They are... By... It's a scenario which you often get in wartime. These are the aircraft in production. We're going to buy them. They're going to hold the gap until we have the aircraft we want in service. And that's it. If you haven't built enough aircraft in peacetime... You have to buy what you have, of what is available when war comes along. And that's the case. 
Nice hearing. Why was the fairy spearfish designed with a remote control turret? Because they thought it would work. And it should have worked. It should have provided them quite a lot of uh, an extra s a sphere of defense. Uh, Captain Seaforth, other than the Deutschlands and the USN President class heavy frigates, has any other navy built a pocket battleship in the sense of a big cruiser as a cabal ship for a navy with nothing better? Um, not really, because let's be honest, the circumstances you're going to build a such a thing are you're a power who's big enough to have the capacity to actually build a capital ship, but for some reason you don't want to build a capital ship. And basically, you're trying to build a capital ship and cruiser on a minor ship size, and it doesn't really work. And the Vindicator, well, they built less of those than they did the uh, the Brewsters, but you know, they served quite well. They allowed air groups to develop. They helped the US Marine Corps. They helped others. You know, it's it, it's a thing of. It's an aircraft. You've not got enough aircraft. You're going with what is available. You might not like it. You might wish you had something better. But the trouble is, sometimes all you've got is what was built. And what's built is what was ordered. And if you didn't order anything better, you have to deal with what was built. Now, if you want a more puzzling question, okay. A more puzzling question. And I, I, I think I mentioned this in the video, which is going to come out on Saturday next week now. Because what I'm doing is I'm changing the, long, the live video, live stream... The Long Patrol video for it now is going to come out the following Saturday, not the next Saturday, uh, the Saturday straight afterwards, but the Saturday a week later. The reason I'm doing this is literally to take, A, some pressure off in terms of timing and making sure I'm happy with it. But, B, it's also because this week is already slightly crowned in terms of videos, and I, I've got to move the live to a Friday anyway. Because of my sister going up to salon. So basically what's going to happen is the um, Key Ships video is going to come out on Friday. On Thursday. And the live's going to be on Friday this week. And then last week's, Long Patrol for last week's live is going to come out on Saturday. And that's going to be the new policy going forward. But in that video, I've already mentioned something which has confused me. Okay, For a good solid two to three days... If you know anything about YouTube analytics, one of the things it tends to flash up in the system is what other channels your viewers are watching, okay? And I had a channel flash up and I was going, what is that? I then looked it up and learned a little bit about it and it was sort of interesting, but it was I still don't know, see the link between it and my channel. But... For some reason, for a good few days, the third most likely video channel that came up, sort of, it was, it was sort of, it went Drakenfell, the Chieftain, and it went Rin Penrose. I do not know what the link is between my channel and Rin Penrose, and what viewer, why viewers are watching both though, uh, watching both those, but that's apparently what they're watching. So if anyone has any suggestions, please do put them in. Um, but no, now it's back to normal where it goes Rex's Hangar, Sub Brief, Unauthorized History of the Pacific, uh, History of the Pacific War podcast, which I'd love to do at some point. Um, not a pound for air to ground. They're doing well. Ed Nash's Military Matters, Caliban Rising, Aviation History, Battleship New Jersey, of course, Military History Visualized, um, I'm not sure what IHYLS is. That's a new one to me. Armakari history, important history, of course. Always like important history. Uh, Dark Seas and Central Crossing. Again, not sure what Central Crossing is. It appears to be a channel about the Japanese Navy. Hmm, looks cool. But still, do not know why... 
why I am um, managed to get so many uh, get such a cross uh, crossover for three days with Rin Penrose's channel. Before any of you go look up Rin Penrose, I should explain that Rin it, Rin is a VTuber, which is something I had to learn what it was. It's a virtual YouTuber. I learnt things. It's always worrying when I learn things. Okay, Rob there. Do you have any interesting ideas for USS Franklin on Bunker Hill? It was their like new condition as Navy for many years and visual an ultimate reconfiguration that was never done. Um Are you meaning Franklin as in CV-13? Hmm. Um, if you're talking about the carriers, the um, Essex-class carriers... Well, the U.S. Navy's always uh, had so many of them. They're always toying with ideas, and I'm always experimenting on them. Um, there's so many different rebuilds, etc., and all, all sorts of ideas on them. And they really did love those ships. Honestly, the Essex class are probably the high point for the U.S. Navy in terms of carriers, because those were the ones they were most emotionally attached to. I know more recent carriers have been a lot better. I'm not. That, that's not what I'm claiming at all. Okay, I'm not saying that, they, you know, recent carriers aren't better. What I'm saying is that for the U.S. Navy, the Essex class are the emotional attachment carriers. Uh, they are their, um, I don't know. Well, for me, when I'm doing, record, uh, sorting out naval history, of course, what do I normally talk about I use if I'm doing talking about things? A fluffy torpedo appears. So they're sort of the equivalent of this for them. I, it's something which is not just functional for their job, but gives them emotional support. Because who wouldn't like to hold and stroke a fluffy torpedo? Who wouldn't? Even my little cousins are going to get that joke. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was probably they had reconfiguration uh, configuration ideas in them. So you get recommendations based on what we watch. Yeah, I can get some analytics data on. This is what your audience is finding interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was asking a question. <laughs> yep, I know all the channels. <laughs> As a VTuber. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I could pull off being a VTuber. I don't think I could do it. But it, it, it's a fun thing to think about sometimes. No, my my rig would not be a cartoon personification of Warspite. Let's be honest. That would be Drakenfell's rig. My rig would be... Oh, good lord. What would my rig be? You see, going by PhD, it's got to be one of the armored carriers. Probably HMS, Impla uh, HMS Implacable. But going by book, it's going to be HMS Nubian. <laughs> or Renown. Oh yeah, Renown. Renown be it. I'm, I'm going Renown. Yes, CB-13. Yeah, both those are kept around with various ideas in plan, but basically the US Navy doesn't like to get rid of any of its Essexes. To scrap an Essex, you practically have to force the US Navy to concede. No, most of On 14,000 tons... Could the Panzer Chief ships have an all-forward quad 11-inch gun ship like the Dunkirk class, whilst remained... Yeah, 
you could in theory, but you're gonna have fun with armor. You're gonna have fun with armor. I just want three quarters of the subscribers get warning. <laughs> Look, it just shows literally what it comes up with is, as I said, it's channel analytics, audience, and channels that your audience watches comes up, and the most popular, basically across the audience. What are the most popular 15 channels? And as said, for about three days, number three was Rin Penrose, which was, I found funny, but I don't, but I find funny on two things. One, I, when I watched some of Rin's episodes, I was sort of looking at it going, what the frigate is that? I went, I've seen the shorts, for starters. I had seen Penrose's shorts, so I went, okay, fine. I just sort of recognized when I went, I'll go watch the videos. There are some computer game videos, some of those things, streams, I suppose. But, again, I do Ultimate Android Adrenaline, so I don't see that as a link. And I'm just sitting there going, I found it funny, but I was also mostly finding it funny because I'm thinking, what is the link that is making people watch this and my channel? What is causing this to happen? And I know they've got many, many subscribers. It's kind of like, of course, they're going to have Drakenfell and the Chieftain in there and Rex's Hanger, and Subbrief, because those are all several hundred thousand subscribers. You know, you've got Drakenfell's got 475,000, Chieftain 284, Subbrief 294, Rex's Hanger 176. So you expect to see those. What you don't expect is to find number three between the Chieftain and Rex's Hanger at that point, Rin Penrose, and so going... Yes, you have several hundred thousand subscribers, but what is the overlap here going on here? <laughs> oh, it's all TANF, is it? It's all TANF. Well, don't. Since Bunker Hell Franklin were fully rebuilt after damage, stuff, and, and therefore, since they were so new, they wanted to completely rebuild from scratch, that was never done. Yeah, but also there's the fact that when you have to rebuild a ship, you are you are rebuilding it, but there are compromises made. So there's going to be damage there that you always have to worry about. It was British. It's it's British. Is it? Okay, it's British. It's British people complaining about British things. Okay, I, I will accept that. I will accept that. Um, quite nice thing to say. Nice to say, everyone. Question seven: In what in what night attacks did the RN did in World War Two? Would a nine point two inch Baltimore sized with an eight inch torpedo broadside have been lethal? Eight torpedo broadside. Um, any of them? Let's be honest. If you've got nine point two in, nine nine point two inch guns, and you're able to fire eight let's say, 21-inch torpedoes on either broadside, you, you're going to be lethal in any night attack. There is not a single night attack that you're taking part in that someone is not going to be crying. And let's be honest, the Italians don't have that much armour to deal with you. The Germans certainly don't. I mean, nicest way, one of those might deal with Scharnhorst without any... without Duke of, Duke of York might show up and just go, it's already sunk! And 9.2-inch is going... Yeah, we got bored waiting for you. Both of you? Yeah. How many 9.2 inch shells ra ra sort of, ra you know, <sighs> rain down upon Sharnost here? Well, um, we need to go home. We've run out of shells. Oh, so you fired them all? Yes. Some of their YouTube channel owners are going, why are my viewers watching Dr. Al Clark? I would like to meet those people and shake their hand. Oh, no, surprise that surprised me. I watch a lot of Beard Meets Food. I have been actually planning half our trip round Scandinavia for um Shipshape, and I will please note on Shipshape. I'm involved in planning the trips. Uh, trips. That's what I'm doing. The other stuff is all being. The rest of the team are sorting out. I'm helping where I need to. 
but they are taking a lead. There was a flooding and all sorts of fun things which are rain cause things to be delayed, and there will be an announcement at some point with all those details coming out. All be sorted. But I'm of course planning trips. So the meetups which we do might well be going to take place in restaurants which are famous for their eating challenges in Scandinavia. And I might have planned to enroll the ship shape team in several of those eating challenges. <laughs> I'm not saying I've enrolled myself in them, but I've enrolled all of my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dan going, I'm going to be healthy. Alex! Mm -hmm. <laughs> there goes. If I chat in over in live, I'll ask if she has overlapped the dock. Please do. I'd be really surprised if Rin knew of me or knew of there and had any answer for that one. <laughs> it was a well time meeting. Hmm. Yeah, it's basically it's going to be July we're going. Oh. All right, so let's go for questions. <laughs> nice to see everyone. Oh, is that nice, to everyone. Yeah, I've been watching VTubers throughout the week. Ah, there you go. This is where it's coming. I, I didn't know. I was just going. I don't know where this link is coming from. <laughs> um, let's say. So, has some bright spark ever tried to get planes to land on rails? Yes, and they also tried to get planes to land on crash mats. Uh, Midway's late, a super controversial late 60s refit. They always have plans, okay? Nice way. There are various points where the US Navy really should be concentrating on building new ships, but kind of like the British were victorious, they just don't go so bad. If the Americans had had the same victorious like the British... Look, if you look at the costs of Victorious, Eagle, and Ark Royal and their conversions, the Royal Navy could have bought three to four Forestals. I know Drac says two, but once you work through some of the other costs, etc., I swear it's closer to three to four. Um, and if you go back in time, you could have bought and you could have built the Malters, all four Malters, and completed them to a midway enhanced. Because they'd be built as it from uh, when they were finished, midway enhanced version, angled flight deck design, and oh my lord, would that help? Brits make good villains because we sound so posh and so nice that the moment we go bad, you know, we've gone really bad. That's the truth. <laughs> There's even ideas to catch planes. Yeah, there's also a skyhook system. Let, let's put it aside. There, there has been as many types of ideas of how to catch sh aircraft on the ships as there have been um, ideas for how to, you know, launch them. Um, Nightmare Cooch. How, knife 40, 40, France surrenders, but the RN gets their hands on the burn. What do they need to do to make her operationally useful? Re-engineer lifts, rip out all the control, uh, rip out all the um, rails, and re-engineer the lifts. That's what you need to basically need to cut her down, re-engine lifts, and probably do something about the engines to make her operationally useful. But as long as you've fixed the lifts and you've got space for the aircraft to operate, 
then you can probably use her as some sort of escort carrier, deterrent carrier, somewhere in the North Atlantic, etc. Um... Black Mars, what happens if the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy Fleet have RP-3 and Tiny Tim Rockets in 1959? They are very, very happy. I mean, if you have those, then you have suppressive rockets, and you basically, you're more likely, uh, again, you'd be re-evaluating things like the Skewer, but also the Fairy Fulmar. Because if you've got rockets like that, okay, you probably don't have the Swordfish carrying them in into the attack at, at night in Taranto, but probably a Fulmar would be. You might well have launched the full miles to do it because with rockets, they would could be attacking with basically the air defenses with pretty much impunity. Um, doing a dash through, firing the rockets as the swordfish come in, and it's just going to help, and it's going to attack, especially the the, the the lighter ships, the lighter craft, destroyers, etc. Do you imagine? Don't worry. How quickly and easily? Uh, Oh, the the Aster 30 series um, effort can be converted to Mark 41 land based systems such as modified Sky Saber. Um, well, the Mark for uh, Sky Saber is known as I think C Scepter. C Scepter is what it's pretty much used, uh, which is the version of CAM, and that can be used on Mark 41 quad packed. I think the Asters are all able to be Mark 41 anyway because of various other allies who use the Aster system. The silver, uh, silver and Aster system. So basically, that can be quite done quite easily. It's basically it. You need the systems to put them in. Nice, Aaron. So would it be right that in an environment where French six and a half inch armored cat light cruisers are running around, the two Leipzig free nineteen twenty seven Koenigsberg and the one Emden cruisers are locked in due to treaty from World One? Um. Probably. Quite possibly, yes. I, I, good lord. Okay, I'm not getting in there. Mash should have been Mac, not looking at keys. Don't worry. When I get there, I'll look at it. Uh, question eight from Night Security Front. So, would it be right that an environment where... Oh, I've answered that one. Uh, Ethan Young. Okay, don't know if I asked this on another chat, but do you see a future for heavy missile cruisers like the Kerov class as hypersonic cruise missiles technology move improves? There is a good chance of it. Or at least larger vessels of the scale of the Kerov class. Whether they're caught, they're nuclear powered like the Kerovs is going to be an interesting question. There's going to be an interesting question. But... Harmony. Please note, again, apologies. Um, I, I'd like to say my sister did cook a good lunch. She did. It, it was all fine to eat, but I will say this: the pork had a very strong citrusy flavour. And when asked, she cut up four lemons and four oranges, and stuck them in the roasting can, uh, roasting pan with the pork. And also I did apple juice. So, um, yes, it was cooked. It's it was fine to eat. But, oh my lord, is that probably going to have an impact on everyone's um, ability to digest food. Yeah, it's fun. She's getting... She's very, very much better than she, be, she used to be. And, again, this is my sister who is a brilliant engineer. Very good. Very skilled in so, so many things. Absolutely amazing in many, many things in life. Her one weakness is her ability to cook. But she's persevering. That's a bit too much citrus. That is one way of putting it. Um, Mama Maxwell, what kind of speed could N3 reach if built on an F3 style layout, but same weight armor and guns? 
Well, you see, if you're built on an F3 style layout with 16 inch guns, and you still got the same armor configuration, um, the difference was the F3, not just. The F. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Ah, uh, yes. No, not that one. Yeah. The thing about the F3 that is worthwhile fearing uh, getting, and I'm going to go track down my F3 design so I can show it, is it has more engine space, and it has more engines. So that's going to have an impact. Yeah. Um, Now, uh, the Nelson class, well, it's not really an end freeze, it's a Nelson class. Uh, so Nelsons are end freeze of the G3 equivalents. Um, but do, 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 do. Oh, that's. Is that design? No, that's not design. Okay. There you go. That'll do. That will do. That'll do me. So. I've got some drawings. I can do this. I can do this. Bum bum. Da da dee dee dee. Ba da dee da do do do. Okay, then we have the F3s, and if I've got this to work correctly, if we've got this to work correctly, we say, <laughs> now, I do that. There we go. So, here's the thing. Once you start looking at these designs, and they're not, of course, in direct proportion, one of the things you think realize very quickly is that the F3 has a far bigger funnel uptake, and that will allow more air to get down its engines, and it has more boilers and more power down there. They tend to have, on the designs, well, there's a debate about them, but the debate is, frankly, fairly constant in that they are definitely going to be faster they are definitely going to be more capable and the reality of that probably means that they are going to have more shafts uh, I would s there is an are they going to be two shaft design still um, because if you look at some of their design shaping they do look like they're still a two shaft design but there's a limit to how much power you can shift through two shafts. And again, if we consider them, the F3, well, the F3 had nine 15 inch guns and was supposed to have roughly 112,000 shaft horsepower. And, well, they're going to get to roughly, roughly 29, 20, uh, 29 knots. 
was the official design. So, that's a good design. It's all forward. It's far more slinked up. If you look at the shaping of the F3, you'll see that's far more of a, you know, a fish shape than the Nelson, which is far more of a shape. And... The reality, really, in all that, if you've gone up for a 16-inch guns rather than 15-inch guns, as you notice, those are quite fat turrets. Uh, you probably going to need to have slightly more space in some regards, but it still works and still is going to be viable. So it might actually be slightly longer. Um, if you're planning on keeping it under 35,000 tons, which you are. The F2 fits more easily in the 35,000 ton limit, while um, the F3 would probably have required some massaging of the figures. But again, it's not impossible. So, the thing to think is you would have more engines, more shafts. It, yeah, it's, um, mind myself with the question. What kind of speeds could the N3 reach? In an F3 style route, if the Nelson, because I presume you mean the Nelson, not the N3. The N3, of course, is design is the battleship design before the Nelson class. Um, if the N3 or the G3 had been put into this design, it they could have been faster as well. Uh, but the thing is, if you put this into that design, you're probably talking about 28 knots. That's probably what you're aiming for. So it'd be just about fast, uh, just about faster. And yes, they do have transom stones. The F2 has six guns. The F3 has nine guns. Uh, the F2 has... They all have 15-inch guns. Um, the F2 can do 30 knots plus. Uh, no, the F2 and the F3 both have the 381mm guns, so the 15-inch guns. F3, uh, let's be honest, 15-inch, 50s, etc. Going this route, and it's... If you go this route with 15-inch 50s, you could have ended up with a seriously scary asset. A seriously scary asset, and it's seriously improvement on pretty much all of these ships. I would say, though, though um, one of the interesting things I often find with people is when talking about the F3, the G3, the N3, all these things, they always seem to presume that just because uh, be, that the British aren't going to build as many as the Americans, etc., or something like that. And as I've tried to explain before, the British don't order at the same... The Americans have done a huge batch order of going, we're going to build 16 ships. The British have ordered one class, next class plan on another class after that, but they haven't decided what they're doing, so they haven't ordered them. And so that's the Brit standard British pace of construction. The British don't do like the Americans announcing, we're going to be building 16 ships over this many years. Oh well, yeah, the British might well have built 16 in the same time. But it's sort of, it's interesting. Uh, 
Um, if you know, how come you don't think the area isn't class active because it's destroyed? It's a glass from storage. No. Um, let's see. Well, they're called frigates, uh, for starters, and when you start looking through them, they very much fit in the frigate pattern to me. I know they're now called destroyers and air defense destroyers, but the 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 whole way through the program, they were building frigates. They were thinking frigates, and that's basically the problem. It's one of the interesting scenarios, but again, I'm, I'm I don't want to get into the exact details and things about them too much because that's a scenario which I prefer to do in a recorded video where I could check that I don't say anything I'm not supposed to. So, yeah. Um, basically, the whole way through, the British wanted something which was definitely a destroyer, whereas the French and Italians wanted something that could be classified as a destroyer, but was a frigate, is basically how I put it. And there were many, many problems with that project. There were many, many problems with the project. As said, one of the problems was that the British were going to buy a lot more than the Italians and the French. And therefore, the British expected that they would get a control over construction. Of course, French wanted control of it as well, and the Italians wanted it control. Everyone wanted their own pieces of the pie. And it wasn't really compatible. It's, it's a great fun. Once you get multinational ship procurement... And well, it's far more difficult in many ways than multinational aircraft procurement because there's so many more variety of systems that go in there. Could the F3 have stuck around to the sewers? Um, potentially. Depends how what happened to the World War II. I, Ethan, I, I, I know the official language translation. And I know what they claim, but I am not getting into that one because that requires me to go into details which I would thoroughly, thoroughly check were okay with me going into before I put them out there. But I would never classify them as what I would classify a modern destroyer as. And please note, the Type 45s barely scrape into that classification. They scrape into it, but they barely do. That That's that's worrying, Darius, but enjoy. Good luck. Um, Paul Amos. Is a modern Mac ship building concept a way forward using container type craft with container modules? System interlock, which interlock to give engineering supply space for helicopters. Um, it's a modern Mac ship building it onto. Mm, potentially, potentially. Um, honestly, a modular system is basically what I would think you go with, and I think you could do it quite easily. You're not quite there, Calvin. Look, I, I will be quite happy to say the word sustainment is part of a destroyer requirement in my book. And it's also causes issue with the British because if you consider Type 23s were light frigates, the Type 22s were not. And again, there's an issue with sustainment and how they can sustain themselves on operations. 
and basically there are things we could get into but it's that's it's me being picky but me being look if you're gonna build this this is what you should be building and you're talking to someone who is a fan of the italian production and there's Honestly, the Italian designs, the domestically produced designs, the non-shared designs are often far better, I think, than the designs they do when they work in, co in concert with other people because the Italians tend to give way in a way which they really shouldn't because the Italians produce far better designs. I would argue far better designs than the French. And they tend to be, they tend to give way because they are, I'm not sure, fundamentally nice people or un consistently underestimate their ability to design a ship. I don't know which. Um... My theory is one. Question 8.5. Would I be right to think in any British Empire superpower, a superpower scenario that after the 2006 Nimrod crash, the RAF won't keep the Victor Vulcan and Harry and Sos any later than they have to? Um, pretty much they were trying to get rid of things. Boy, sorry. Doc, how is the editing of the latest Builders coming along? Terrible. Honestly, terrible. For some reason, the sound. I'm still trying to fix it. The sound from Sal has gone super quiet, and the sound from me and Drac has gone very loud. So it's not... We're all recording over the same system. We're all using similar systems. It was all recorded over... Um, oh, what's the system I was using? All that's... It was all recorded over... And I pay money for this system every month. What? A, not Teams. It wasn't that one we were using. We don't use Teams because they don't. none of us like it. Um, when we're doing these things... Zoom. All of it was recorded over Zoom. And all of it was recorded theoretically the same way. And yet, it's, yeah, it's done something weird with the sound. <sighs> and it's annoying me. Please stop the VTubing. <laughs> Why? I, I it, look in nicest way. I have just uh, it, if it happened, it, it it just confused me. I said I was looking at it going. I don't know why these two are linking together. I I found it. I found Rin Penrose funny, and I was watching along going for a bit interesting. And agree, I am. I I think I would from the one. I think the one thing I dro watch where. Their mum, Jin, seen from a Jin, showed up. Uh, yes, Jin would should probably get an extra her, their own channel. But um, I'd add also, in the nicest way, in the new in the new house, there is a very good real chance that when I'm doing the Sunday brew ships, you might find that I'm in a space which my mum can wander into, and you might find brew ships gets it has my mum along as well, making her book recommendations, just to scare you all. And answering questions, and probably doing, saying all sorts of things. Sigla, earlier you discussed the difference in hull form from, uh, from which the RR and the VSN the, the the were required. We see ships only above the waterline in images and have very long setting of hydrodynamics. Uh, how can a layperson understand hydrodynamics from the images and plans understand what the design requirements and maintenance requires? Okay, so think about this. If you require a ship to be faster, you want it to be longer and thinner it, uh, well a greater length to beam ratio i.e. it's got to be a lot longer than it is thinner than it is wider than it's wide if you want a ship to be more maneuverable you tend to want that length to beam ratio to shrink a bit that will increase maneuverability do you want a lot of supplies do you want an ability to go through a long sea? There's a reason why going back to the age of sail the British design ships line were often Beamier, wider, fatter, whatever you want to describe them as, than their French counterparts. The French could get everywhere in the world faster. The British would arrive there in better condition and could actually fight a battle when they got there. You'd very much like my sister answering a question about shore defence. I will try and get her on at some point. I will try and get her on. Goodness knows that would be scary. Um, so basically, when you're looking at a ship, and you're looking at it, the, the question that really answers you and tells you a lot about a ship is, what's the length to beam ratio? And that tells you some uh, quite often the balance that navies are going to go for. 
and what they're looking for in their roles. And you have to remember the American length of beam ratio is in some ways dictated by their global operations, but also dictated by operating with what? Their aircraft carriers. So the British ones are also, to an extent, op uh, defined by operating with our aircraft carriers, which don't have the same operating characteristics as their American counterparts. So, this is something you have to think about when you're looking at the design of ships. And then you've got a case of, is this an anti-submarine warfare hull? Is this an anti-surface hull? What is this hull going to be supporting? There is a reason why we don't tend to want our anti-air anti warfare destroyers hunting submarines. Their hulls really aren't designed for it. But we do want their helicopters assisting in that, being queued by the, uh, the sub-hunting frigates. Frigates, often these days, let's be honest, in sub-hunting terms, they will often do dash manoeuvres, uh, especially with their tail uh, towed sonar rays. It happens. I said, "Are you sure you want Doctor Glass?" I, I have an image of her going, "Also, Christopher Lee." Do you know what it sounds like to stab a man in the back? Because I do. <laughs> I, I, I think you all are underestimating it. If that's the thing you think it will go. <laughs> I've met my mum. <laughs> oh, good lord. She's wonderful, but... Yeah. <laughs> She's the one who used to be able to walk into a school and would make teachers hide by just looking uh, looking down a corridor. <laughs> Not in a, we're going to hide from that, 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 that lady because she's a... Um, a regular complainer sort of way of, oh good lord, she's here. When she comes in, it's bad. She rarely comes in, but when she comes in, oh lord. I hope you learned something. I H O I Y L S. It's another aviation history channel. Cool. Quite a nice title. Um. Nice turn. What is the appeal of a nine point two inch gun, Balmer size candy class? What is the appeal? Nine point nine nine point two inch guns. Least, or eight nine point two inch guns. It's useful. Nine point two inch guns are far more effective than an eight inch gun. They are the same rate of fire, but a far more deadly shell, and therefore they really do even up the balance of explosives delivered with six inch guns. And as we know, the six inch guns can basically go boom, boom, boom. Far more than the eight-inch shells, which is why they tend to overwhelm and swarm their opponents. Kind of like how the British deal with the um, Sharnals. That's basically classic. Should be like I'm busting out of flaming. No, it's more in this case of when she starts uh, starts going right. Then what's your gun a shooting questions? And it starts giving it starts giving a shooting master class and wants to take you out and actually show you how to use her guns. It's quite scary. Okay. This is uh, this is a lady who still likes to go down the range occasionally and put some shots down it. So, you know, has a nation ever built up a state of the art coast navy in a war when it didn't have one before, excluding Rome? Uh, re uh, example Ukraine's drone navy. Um, quite a lot of navies have worked on coastal navies. Uh, I would say Norway really does develop one in World War Two, but that's mainly the Free Norwegians. Um, Scandinavia or uh, Sweden always has a good quality navy. Um, but they haven't had one though before. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, on, if you recreate the second night battle of Guadalcanal for ship shape, I am voting we have Dr. Claus Mom's Admiral Lee. <laughs> hey, look, it's bad enough she's just read the full, the big book about Admiral Lee. I and literally got it delivered, a new copy for me to read. And she nicked it before I managed to read it. Because she felt he was one of her people. 
And I sort of asked about that. She said, he can shoot, my dear. Okay, Mum. Thank you. You taught me as well. Uh, nice, everyone. Uh, nice, everyone. Question 10. How different would the French cruisers be if if their original timeline heavy cruisers had 9.4 inch guns and their light cruisers had 6.5 inch guns? Uh, not much difference on the 6.5 inch guns. On 9.4 inch guns, they'd probably be a lot more, da a lot more threatening. So anyway, we have a 96 year old great grandma who is the best shot in the village. Yes, yes. This is another reason I, I point out about the. Um, the people who write off things like the Home Guard in World War Two. There's a real difference in the Home Guard in World War Two in Britain than in some of the other countries. A, they're mostly full of World War One veterans who were in the army in 1918 who thought they could have beaten Germany if they'd been allowed to carry on doing their job. And B, and well, when I say beaten their Germany, could have absolutely swamped Berlin. They were planning on getting there. The last 100, 100 days campaign is interesting. But secondly, you've got people who are literally, who are in there, who are <clears throat> recon teams, who are the local gamekeeper, and who have actually have shot people before in World War One, so aren't going to be worrying about that one, and have been shooting and keep kept on shooting daily for the lot previous uh, the intervening twenty odd years. Those people are going to start taking a toll on your on your senior officers and your senior NCOs very quickly because they know exactly who to start shooting for. We now need to have a range over clocks. That that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, Mark Atmos, does anyone know how much cruising time twenty gallons of fuel, eight and a half capacity, would give an SPD free? Um, not really sure from my uh, at the top of my head. VB2 substitute well, not fully fueled on May 8th. Coral Sea has to turn back without making contact with IGN. Not long because it depends. Are they cruising the whole time or are they maneuvering? Because if they're maneuvering, that's going to use up fuel even quicker. Mark Hartness, Robert Dents, these two were going to escort CVA 58 United you know, States had she been built. Uh, they were supposed to provide the fighter support. Ah, yes. Bunker Hill and the other. Um, it kept coming up. Bunker Hill and... What was it? I did look her up. Franklin. Yeah, I think they were connected with that project at one point. They were connected at one point with the USS America project as its security. Like Maximus, what if Adrian's Glorious was escorted by two cannon class when she did Shannon's battleship escort her? They would probably have not engaged. If she's got two counties with her, in the nicest way, the counties are going to go and engage them. They have 8 inch guns, they have. They will try and fight an action, but also, if you've got two counties there as well as Glorious, there is no chance that there's not an admiral there. In which case, if there's no aircraft up in the air providing Overwatch, there will be someone looking at the, looking at HMS Glorious's captain, going, "So, explain to me when you decided you were got, because you don't have enough gold braid on you to make you got." So why is there no aircraft up in the air providing Overwatch? Well, sir, we can insert the various orders. I am racing back to the UK. I am pissed off with my air group commander or the other recent one, which is we are off on a secret mission imposed by Churchill. Lovely. We're in enemy. We're in contested waters. There are enemy warships running around. Why do we not have airborne aircraft airborne to spot them? Tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me why. And at a certain point, probably um, gets those aircraft airborne. Long before the sound was a nice sound sharp. In which case, if aircraft spot them long before they show up, A, there's a chance of strikes launched. B, there's a chance that something else starts coming down going, Hello! They'll change course to try and keep away from them. And something will be coming down to go, Hello! 
Probably Warspite coming to go, Hello! Hello, 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 hello. Aren't we pretty? Home guard, the British Home Guard in World War Two, the only force which is ever, only auxiliary force which has been ever been known to regularly frighten the regulars of their nation with their ideas for how to inflict pain and death on their enemies. You want to do what? Set the water on fire. Let them land through that. You want to set. Yeah. Just imagine the poor guy listening. And, Is that against the Geneva Convention? No, the Canadians haven't done it yet. Okay, it's fine. Are you part Canadian? No. But I really liked working with them in World War One. That explains so, so much. We have a pseudo-Canadian in the room. Everyone back away quietly. And no, the upcoming missile test is Vanguard, not Warspite. Warspite hasn't entered the service yet. Warspite will probably do a missile test at some point, which during a certification. Yeah, the Home Guard had ideas for what they were chucking into that fiery water. Uh, that fiery water. Who on the subject of a uh, fuse? Whose bright idea was it to give a good submariner an aircraft carrier instead of submarine a self in the first place? Oh, that's quite common. There's quite a lot of submariners to be going around. I remember I was talking about the rear animal aircraft carriers in the British Naval Aviation. A couple of those have been submariners. It's it's quite common. They were they'd working together. Uh, after all, submariners understand torpedoes, and the primary strike weapon of a carrier is its torpedo bombs. Um, Black Masters, without naval treaties, how long before the British will be forced to expand their shipyards to fit increasing capital ship size? Oh, they'd probably have to do it in about 1924, 25, if not earlier. Um, Dragon Red, it's not just virtual YouTubers. You can now mute the sound, put CC on, auto translate, and AI will generate a voiceover. I am so worried for the poor AI. I really am. Oh, good lord. AI, I, I, I apologize now. Everything I say against you is, is wrong. You poor AI. Are you trying to auto-translate me as I talk? Um, that, that'll be confusing. Uh, Runon, do you think World War II style gun-based night attacks would be could be viable today if the attacking ship was stealthy enough? Do I think World War II style gun-based night attacks would could be viable today? Attacking ship was stealthy enough. Depend on circumstance, and I don't think necessarily stealth is the factor. Stealth is useful, yes, and I do agree. There are some very good examples. The um, or I think the Scourge, and the various other ones of the Finnish and Swedish Bisbees and all those things. The designs are fairly good examples of these, but I think um, you also need to be in sufficiently close in waters with sufficiently enough, uh, for want of a better phrase, geologic uh, geographical features that you can really not stick out and hide as they're getting close. Then you could do a lot of damage very quickly. As let's see, Ross, ships don't have armor, mostly, around most things. Make a throw. What are the odds of there being a Sir Storming challenge? I'd have to know what Sir Storming meant first. Skull, yes. Hmm. 
<laughs> oh. Hey, caramba. Bagmas, US military gets GDP percentage spending on par 967. What fun things do they come up with? Now? Now they get the percentage on par 967? Well, after they fix the US uh, Armed Forces healthcare systems and um, accommodations, and oh good lord, there are so many barracks which need to be fixed. Once we've passed all that, what do they come up with? Well, I'm fairly certain the next generation of cruisers starts entering the water, and no one's going to like the look of those and some SSGNs, as well as they're going to keep up the carriers and other productions. Sturstorming is Swedish fermented herring. Oh, good lord. That's the challenge you... I will gladly sign up Drak and Dr. Dan to it. Mainly, I'm not signing up Gareth, because he will get revenge. And I'm not signing up to it because I'm not that big a fan of fish. But if there is a very large burger, which I know for a fact in Sweden there are some very, very large burgers, and ribs, and barbecue, you will count me into all of those. Blackman and Maximus. U.S. military gets G... Uh, answer that one. Uh, Paul Westwick. Given the talk of 9.2-inch guns, had the cruisers that shadowed Bismarck and Denmark Strait been so good, would they have, have had a go or still stuck to shadowing? Well, they probably would have stuck to shadowing, but the question is whether they'd have had a go once Holland arrived. And the thing is, Holland kept them out because he didn't want, um, how do I put this, crossfire involved. But 9.2-inch guns, they're useful, and they could have done some severe damage because also... Thing is, what do the Germans build in co in contrast to for the Hippers? Do they try and make them 9.2 inch gun cruisers? That's going to complicate things. Do they leave them as 8 inch gun cruisers? Do they go with 6 inch guns? Do they go with a try and go with 11 inch guns? It's all going to be interesting. Come on, we presume optionally manned aircraft, uh, mancraft, aircraft can be developed faster because much can be done without endangering test pilots. Um, I were on such a program running. Honestly, there are all sorts of options being run of, uncr of uncrewed systems, but mostly what they're doing is they're testing out the systems for optionally crewing the aircraft on aircraft which are already certified. So they're taking crewed aircraft that have been designed, uh, crewed airframes that have already been designed and certified, turning them into optionally crewed, and then doing test flights with them, usually with someone sitting in the, in the aircraft who can go, boom, on the controls and take over if there's a problem. Robert Dunning, assuming the, uh, Robert Dunning, assuming the Royal Navy actually gets their CV... AO1s. What is the most likely air group evolution for the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s? Assuming we have to rely on aircraft from our own, our own timeline exclusively. Oh, you're going to go Buccaneers eventually, and you're going to then go Buccaneers and Phantoms, and eventually you might end up going Super Hornets. That's the probable thing. The interesting thing is going to be whether we get can get Hawkeyes or something for them. Um, but it'll be it will be that sort of evolution because the bucking if we consider um, the phantom stays in service with Japan till 2021 it was 2013 with Germany so that more than gives you cover to get up to the super hornet. And the Buccaneer as well is sort of pretty much the same. And I think the Super Hornet is the only thing you could really adapt. The Super Hornet comes into service in 1999. So probably you would have had Buccaneers and, uh, Buccaneers and Phantoms up until about 2000. Anything else you develop is going to be costly and are going to require developing something. Whereas Buccaneers are in service till...
Now, the Blackburn Buccaneer is in service till 1994 with the Royal Air Force. Uh, making it go for six more years. If you consider the first flight of the Super Hornets in 1995, I could see that being going over five, four, four, five years. So, yeah, it would be... It, there's You're not going to get an F-14. That's too heavy for the CBA-1. So your options are going to be Super Hornet. You could maybe go for a French aircraft. There are various options in the French naval uh, scenario. Uh, there are various options available to them. They, you know, if we consider Super Tard, could be, could do. Um. We could go with the Raphael, but again, the thing is, the British probably wouldn't go with the Raphael because getting involved in French aviation projects is notoriously difficult, and the British wouldn't want to be linked in with them because then they wouldn't have the option of going their own way. So whilst they might go with the Raphael, uh, the odds are they keep the Buccaneer going until the ho the Super Hornet comes in service and then replace both of their uh, both their airframes at the same time. And they would have come into service sort of mid to late sixties, about the same time the. Various things came into service with the Royal Navy. Cal Um Isn't the Sam T the landed as the 30? Uh, it's sort of from my knowledge, but it's it's slightly different again because it's a land based version. Um, Staff Thompson, have you happened to see the concept rendering of the Type 83? Uh, there are many concepts, there'll be many more concepts which have come out before the final one comes out. Please note I will take absolutely no notice of any of them until I see the final design authorized. And I will be still arguing over until the final design is authorised. It's a long way away before it's going to go to authorization. We have to build the whole second batch of the Type 26 before that yard's going to be free. Um, to my mind, you are more likely to see a firm design for the Type 33 frigate, which we built after the Type 32s, before you see a firm design for the Type 83s. See, so if we had a large carrier, will we not get naval and not have navalised typhoon? Steve, who's going to pay for it? If you if you talk about navalising typhoon, the only person who's going to use that is going to be Britain. So we've got to bear all the costs for redesigning the entire airframe. Navalising the typhoon, the typhoon is that is landing on a carrier. Um, not sure what happened over the BS there. It disconnected and reconnected. Don't know why, but. Basically, it's a controlled crash. It's an absolutely controlled crash. The, the Eurofighter is not designed for that, so no. No, we wouldn't go with a navalized Eurofighter. I have, I have written papers around this and looked at this, and basically to navalize a Eurofighter to operate from a carrier, you have to redesign the entire airframe. You have to redesign quite a lot of avionics, and you have to redesign quite a lot of the structure of the internals because you redesigned the airframe. You don't want to do that. It's going to basically, that means you're basically building an entirely new aircraft. That's too expensive. It's far cheaper to go to Super Hornet. And then if you think about it, the British then can go where we have two air groups. And what you would probably find is the British like to have two, ty uh, two types of aircraft, at least two air types of aircraft and service. So probably you would find that Instead of having Harriers, you would probably place a, replace a lot of things. So the Royal Air Force will probably be like 50-50 Typhoons and Super Hornets. And the Royal and the Fleet Air Arm would be all Super Hornets. And therefore, that would keep the air groups going. And basically, what would... Uh, it's a really interesting thing is... Would you replace certain numbers of the Tornadoes with Super Hornets? Potentially. Uh, potentially, you replace that. You probably replace Jaguars, Buccaneers, all those things in uh, which were put into Royal Air Force service. An equivalent timeline would equivalent this probably be replaced by whatever aircraft replaced that, but fulfilled that role would be replaced by Super Hornets. Okay. 
Ragnarok, the three people you don't want to hear are, I'm bored from when they are in the machine shop. US Marine Mechanics, Royal Navy Submariners, and English Gardeners. Oh, good lord. And also, the CVA-1 is not that large a carrier. It's a decent sized carrier, but it's not the largest of carriers. And again, it's, it's not designed for taking a land-based aircraft. Stafford, if you want to look up some really funny things, look up some of the early concept art for the Type 26. Let alone the early concept art for the Duke, uh, uh, Type 23 Duke class. Oh, there's some of that still going around the internet. And oh my lord, does that make you giggle. <laughs> so, Thompson, in terms of destroyer tenders, could the USN fit fold away carains on the ESBs to replenish VLS ESLs if DDGs were tied up and uh, tied in after it? Oh, potentially. Potentially, but it's again, it's going to have to cost them actually funds of actually do, doing it and fitting that in to do it, do it. And that's going to take the ESBs away from other things they're doing. And let's be honest, the ESBs, I know a lot of people like to joke about them not being useful, but the moment you need those, you're going to really need those to do their original job. They're going to be highly vital things, and all you're going to do is make them even more vital targets. Um, I would say probably, considering their size and firepower and cohesion, that theoretically Mark Antony's fleet should beat the Greeks at the Battle of Salamis. But uh, I would dare never bet against the strong position the Greeks have managed to take up at the Battle of Salamis. Hope that answers your question, Blackman Maximus. I say, everyone, nice to say, everyone. Question eleven: Why did the French go for twenty-two-inch torpedoes post World War One? Honestly, because think about what the twenty-two inches are in millimeters, and it works. My coach, nine fifty-seven. Everyone's looking around the docks. Same one he found the town class in. Finds three pristine 1850s steam ships line. What, if anything, can he use them for operationally? Nothing. He can use them for hulks to keep crew, uh, keep accommodate personnel in shipyards in, but he can't really use them for anything. You know, that's, they're, they're steam ships of line. They are not... Uh, they're 1850s. They are 100 years old almost at this point. There is nothing he can really use them for. Um, earlier, Steve Clark, earlier, you were discussing the issue of getting HP for a two horsepower for a two shaft design. Would installing contra rotating props like torpedoes would this work, or is this a, a, a problem? Why? Uh, basically, contra rotating propellers work when you're dealing with the size of the propellers you're dealing with on a torpedo. Once you're dealing with the size of a propeller you're dealing with on a ship. The sheer amount of force you're going to have working backwards down the system is going to create a lot of problems. Um, you have to it, basically. Uh, there are real limitations put on by the sheer weight of water you are trying to move. So my point on Typhoon was you it being a carrier fight first and land based fighter second, so it'd be a design it from ground up as carrier craft. Why? The Typhoon isn't designed by Britain. Typhoon is the Eurofighter project. Who there wants a naval who would there wants to pay for a navalized a, a fighter? Who wants to? It's not a British project. It's a European project. And the only ones who would have a carrier for it would be the British. Because the French don't want it because they have the Raphael. And for them, therefore, the Eurofighter Typhoon if it was made into a carrier project, would be a competition. They don't want it. So the only ones who want it are Britain. So anyone's going to look around and go, well, we don't want to do that. Why does Germany want to wait a, a pay for a navalized uh, Eurofighter Typhoon? Why does Italy? They don't. 
unless you've had suddenly a whole growth in a carriers being procured by the various navies and they require them, it's not going to happen. Dracknard, the only reason they designed the carrier version of the F-35 is the US Navy wanted them. Yes. The only reason that happens is the US Navy. Because they're ordering enough of them. Fleet Air Arm aren't going to get enough to order it. And the Britain go British government isn't going to do what the the French government does, which is basically subsidise Raphael to produce the, uh, produce um, their, their maritime aircraft. Because that's a hugely expensive mi mission. I, I I'm, can you see where you're coming from, Steve? But it's just it's just not going to happen. It's just not. They they're not that kind, and they're not that willing to spend money, especially not for something they're not interested in. So, I'm going to ask, what country's ship ratio, what ship ratio best fits the human ratio, divine architecture? I uh, have no idea. For that, I need to go and remind myself what divine architecture ratio is. So let's go look at the cur cur the uh, figures. Do -do 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 -do. Please give me a figure. Give me something I can. Uh, give me something mathematical I can use. Nope. What's the other option you're using? Divine architecture or human, if it's the human ratio. Human ratio. Uh, human ratio. Um... Honestly, not able. To, I need more. I need more figures to work with that one. Honestly, the figures I'm getting are not making sense. There was France was initially involved in the Eurofighter program. They spat their dummies out over work share, not being enabled, and went and upgraded Rafael Tech Demonstrator. No, they wanted everyone else to pay for an enabled version. No one else wanted to be involved in it. And again, this is the problem um, because who else was going to buy an enabled version? Only them, and to navalize that aircraft, if you were built them all to navalize, etc., from the beginning, you'd add a huge amount of cost onto everyone. So, it doesn't really work. Well, yeah, you are right that the French left because no one else wanted to carry aircraft. But even if the British had been in there, no one else would have wanted to carry aircraft. So it'd been Britain, France against everyone else. So Britain and France would have ended up leaving, and then the French would have gone with navalized Raphael, and the British wouldn't want to. Uh, the The odds are the British always go with the Super Hornet, and the reason is the Super Hornet fits the British procurement line on timeline. The thing about this, 
you're all thinking about the Eurofighter, but what happens if the British go to the Americans, we'd like in on the Super Hornet design program? So the Super Hornet becomes a joint program between Britain and America. That makes a lot of sense for Britain at that time period. It also fits with their pattern of usually balancing European and American systems. If you look at the British procurement, they often have domestic, but they often also have a European system and an American system because they like to have a foot in both camps. So Eurofighter for the Royal Air Force, Super Hornet for Royal Air Force and Fleet Air Arm would fit. Nine six eight three one. Be nice. Hello, Dan. How are you doing? Have you heard my very nice plan for you and your uh, eating in Sweden? Which is apparently the food challenge capital of Europe, according to Beard Meats Food. Um, Danny Phillips, it is third. It, Danny Phillips, if I don't know, Black Christmas, uh, Admiral Nelson and his fleet versus the Spanish Armada, what can he do with more advanced ships and historical knowledge? Wipe them out. Uh, Nelson's fleet versus the Spanish Armada, there is not a single ship left to the Spanish Armada within five minutes. Within, well, I would say, love to say five minutes, but probably within five hours. Uh, Dave Harrison, there, there are options. Yeah. It's not... Just, it, they could have lost their mind, but the thing is, they probably don't. Because, again, it's a lot of money, and one of the people who do shoot this down, they shoot down for the French are the British. Because it costs a lot of money for what they want. Don't forget, that depends if you count Iceland as part of Europe. Mm, there's fun times. We like Iceland. Stafford, got to go back, back, be back in around 45 minutes. Looking forward to it. Take care. I will probably still be here, because I'm planning about four hours this evening, I think. So. Nice turn. Why did the French go for 22-inch torpedoes post World War I? I think I've answered that. The French went for them because the French liked big torpedoes, and 22-inch torpedoes fit their millimeter size they like at that time. Because you have to remember the French don't work in inches, they work in top millimetres and centimetres. So we might call it a 22 inch torpedo, but it's kind of like we call the British torpedoes a 18 inch and they're 17.72 inch. Which works out differently again in millimetres. You might notice 17.72 works out at 450 millimeters. Twenty-two inches the French workout usually works out slightly more than 558 millimeters. Um Rod Dennett, what do you think about a timeline where a bomb a bomb version of the F uh B, the Aardvark, replaces the A6 and A7 and forms an all swing wing air group with the F14? I think the US Navy's gone for a very long range strike package. And that's actually not an unlikely scenario if they're going for a heavy long range strike pa strike package. Iceland has fermented shark. Don't uh, 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 don't take this the wrong way everyone, but from, I've seen enough of Rin Penrose's videos no one mentioned fermented shark to Rin. Um, having watched enough of those, I, I you can get away with me cuz I have a fluffy torpedo but from what I gathered from... This was literally one video in. I worked out very quickly that there are apparently fluffy sharks for sale in Ikea, which I had never realized and never noticed. I must admit, whenever I go into Ikea, looking at their fluffy toys has not been on my list of priorities, which I feel wrong of now, because the sharks did look cool. And, um... Yeah. They are very attracted to them. They are very critical to them. I mean, I, I mean, 
for them, they're kind of like my fluffy research assistants are for me. So, uh, yeah, d d don't mention that on my channel. That's advice. But I worked that one out quite quickly. Okay, the idea of Lovey Sharks are now taking over this channel as well. <laughs> I shouldn't have mentioned it. The Blahaj. Are they? The Blahaj? Blahaj? Yeah, good lord. <laughs> okay. When I am buying all my shelving from Ikea, I will see how much they are and maybe get one. I obviously need one for a Naval History channel. I need uh, that room. I need an emotional support CV6 from Kobe from a talk of <laughs> Ditto! Ditto, I need CV6. I need to get my Belfast finished. I need actually to get the, the, the materials to finish it. At this rate, I'm going to b end up buying another bu another Belfast and using that com the components of that to finish it. Um, <laughs> well, friends, what I really need is an emotional support plus HMS War Spite. Drac is working on that. What do you think? What do you think the um, uh, you know future is going to need? Take care, Dave. Good luck with your early shift. Thank you for staying. What about navalized FB Triple One, the even bigger artwork? Um, be interesting. It's potential because uh, honestly, the artwork starts out with a lot rough strip capability, if I remember correctly. So there are some things in the airframe which makes it actually more viable to go for it. Now, remember, it's alive. This is nice. We we try, we try. I've got a speeding ticket now, but I'm still alive. My first ever speeding ticket. Um, Daniel Phillips, if Sturdy ends up as and Sturdy, I, it, I'm I'm presuming it's Sturdy because Sturdy is S T U R D double -E. I, I I did read that point is Study, and we then I noticed the R and went, okay, it's Sturdy, okay. So just saying that for future reference for everyone, so you don't try and confuse the dyslexic anymore. It's a bit cruel. Um, ends up as a first Sea Lord instead of BT. Woohoo! What policies does he follow? Well, who would be the most likely to replacement for BT after falling at Jutland? And what would their policy be? If BT fell at Jutland, it's most likely to be sturdy. And their policies most likely are to be slightly different when it comes to the Washington Treaty. Um, and slightly different when it comes to naval procurement. I think, honestly, sturdy could go for the bat of the Admiral class conversions rather than courageous and glorious. I think so. Miles Range, the F-1 started out with major engine issues, which was part of what led to the F-14 having the body lifting body. They needed to keep intakes for the TF-30s, free of bends. Ah, yes. U-2 and C-130 were carry cable. Not really, okay? They they did it for a... They did it for a... We can do this, but they weren't really carrier capable. No one really wanted to operate them from a carrier. They just did it so they could show off. Dragon, uh, uh, hey here, I, uh, hey, I swear you YouTubers uh, are obsessed with fluffy things that are dangerous. From your tor your torpedo to blocks of TNT, I'd not be surprised to find Drac as a fluffy sea mine. It's potential. But the thing is, here's the point I would like to make out. World of Warships has kept telling me that someday they are going to send a, um, create an even bigger fluffy torpedo, and they are going to send me one. I have never yet received it. Nicest way. They keep promising me a bigger fluffy torpedo. And I only have this one. It's not tiny. And it's fine for demonstrations, but imagine with that big green screen, which I'm hoping to have when I'm in my next place, what I can do with a large fluffy torpedo. A truly large one. Okay. Right. 
I mean, YouTube was... Yeah, it did not that many operations and not that much. Dan just going, I just want the fluffy freebies. Yep. Dan, uh, in nicest way, if the Defense Leaders Conference had fluffy freebies, Dan would have been, uh, hoovered them all up. <laughs> Large fluffy it's like it's like more than emotional support. <laughs> Load a set of them into a fluffy U boat. Oh, a fluffy U boat. <laughs> okay, right. So, um, see, right, modern lead time. Oh no, and I think I missed that question from Nights of Grim. Would the French having 9.4 inch armed cruisers and the British having 9.2 inch armed cruisers have scared the Germans and Italians? Not really. The Italians have already built the equivalent and the Germans would have just sort of gone, okay, we're going to have to go bigger. But let's be honest, the 11 inch armed ships would have, n the 8 inch armed ships they had a theoretical chance against. Against a 9.2 inch they don't have any chance. Rate of fire and sheer firepower would just not be good. Um, for them, um, Steve Clark, model lead time. It seems that the ship construction model one two was far quicker than today. How much lead time does a modern navy need to build a class of twelve warships in the seven to nine thousand ton range, the, the space range? Oh, you're probably at least talking about a decade of development going into those ships before they even start they start constructing them. And depending on the yards and facilities, you could be talking. Let's say you can build two at a time, two to three at a time. So six months, six months, six months, so roughly 18 months throughput if you were building at maximum efficiency, which none of the yards are doing. Um, start one, have that six months long, then start next, then start next. So you'd have three in any progress at any one point. Well, that gets, when that gets to 18 months, you start the fourth one. Uh, da -da 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 -da. You want to build 12... Um, you're probably talking about 78 months at least, so that's to my mind 16 and a half years at the least. Probably if you're doing under normal construction rules, you're probably talking closer to 20, 22 years. Fluffy 4.7 inch mount. Oh, we'd love those. A fluffy HMS unicorn. Yes, you need a fluffy HMS unicorn. I agree with that. I, I endorse this. So. If the multi class was built, would a talk of a CVA one like design come around more in the seventies? And what would a successor design look like? I'm not sure. If you've got a multi class design, if they've been built and in service, they could be in service for at least the next 30, 40 years. Look at the midways. So they would probably come into service in nineteen fifties, a multi class, and if they're in service for thirty years, they're well into the nineteen eighties. So you're probably pushing things back. You could even be pushing things into the early 1990s. So it, it, it's an interesting different scenario. And it's a very different scenario from what you're thinking. And it depends how long they keep all four of them. Um, if the supersonic Harry had been built instead, do you think a VTOL CV01 carrier class would have been more likely? Potentially. Or, I think if you've got the supersonic Harry coming to service, I think the Invincibles look very different. I do think they look very different. I'd say more likely 30 to 36,000 tons in full displacement. Um, would a 9.4 inch gun make the Sirkov worse ship? It wouldn't. 
There's no way you can make it worse. It, it's, gun, it's gun range is literally limited by the stability of the hull and the fact it can't see as far as it needs to. There's no way you can make it better. There's no way you can make it worse. It's as bad as it can be. Um... So, and I said, as the British learned in, had learned in World War One that the uh, armored car cruisers were floating death trap. No, they learned that armored cruisers, which were very old design by that time, were not up to the standard. And honestly, let's let's be honest. Let's consider how long it had been since they built them, and look at the ones which were killed. You're talking about not exactly the newest armored cruisers that are caught in a scenario which they were not prepared for and were not good for. So, yeah. Um, they offered they offered to cut them as quickly as they could cut them because they hadn't replaced them. They hadn't built modernized versions of them. As I've said before, if you'd kept up with armored cruiser construction, you'd been talking about a 15 to 18,000 ton cruiser. You probably would never have built Courageous and Glorious and Furious. Because if you've got 18,000 ton armoured cruisers as well as battle cruisers in service, why do you need to build a special large, uh, a special battle cruiser to do the job of Glorious, Courageous and Furious when you can send in a squadron of the armoured cruisers and reinforce them by battle cruisers going through the other, uh, other, par uh, other passage? It's just not going to happen. Take care, Tanif. Good luck. Um, but again, what do you think of the Quick Sync program, and is the RN going to get any? Which Quick Sync program are you talking about? Because there's many, many systems on the Quick Sync program, and it's basically a name for the American Rapid Resourcing Systems. And again, the British have their own equivalents. So the British have their own pro uh, their own program. We British have our own program system, which is about rapid procurement of weapons and systems and things when they're needed. So. I think which of the quick sync programs are you talking about and the answer is if we need them yes we'll probably get them if we don't mm -hmm. so if you can make a good case to the minister and the treasury and the government the rest of the government and that, again the point is always it's the government making decision I always love it when people go there is this many billion hold in the treasury in the ministry of defense's uh, budget where are they going to find the funds and you sit there and go well the government has decided what they're procuring. The government has decided what they're spending on them. And so the government has the job of marrying those two. You're saying it's the Ministry of Defence problem. It's basically saying the people we have in charge of administering what our decisions have now got to fix the problems our decisions have created. Not us. And that's completely absolving our responsibility when it's not. It's the government's problem. Back most of the U.S. has the Pratt Whitney R4 436 uh, 360 Wasp Major available in 1949. What gets built and how does the war go? Um, pretty much everything that's built in 1939 is probably going to be a lot more capable, but in the nicest way, that's too late to help the U.K. That's too late. It's available in 1939. Great. I've told you before. I've said before. Aircraft design on a three-year spec. There's going to be no aircraft designed for it at that point. Uh, it's basically going to affect the American aircraft in 1941 onwards, which is going to make them more capable. Lovely, but, you know, that's it's going to affect the war from that point onwards. It's going to make them more capable. Take care, Bill Fry. Okay, I don't know. How well would non-radar equipped Blaskers have done in World War One? Not that great. They would have been really useful, but they would have basically been a battle cruiser in World War One. They weren't a battle cruiser by World War Two, but they were a battle cruiser in World War One.
Seneca Nero, that's just being cruel to me. And I'm not doing that. Um, nice to go through one. Question 15. Would 8-inch guns be seen as insufficient in an environment where British 9.2-inch and French 9.4-inch guns are running around? Yes. But they also might be all you can have. Let's see, Mitchell. In the 1920s, 30s, who would the U.S. Naval Attaché report to? The Ambassador. The U.S. Naval Attaché reported to the Ambassador. And then... After above that, they had an admiral they would report to, usually uh, not directly to the CNO, usually other officers in between. There was another admiral in between who they would report through. I forget their title. Um, Black Marcus, top five ships you would save from the uh, Abel Baker Nicholas S to be turned into museum ships. So, Operation Crossroads, let's see. Well, I'd say Pensacola and... Um Arkansas. Independence, probably. Because it'd be quite good to have one of her around to sort of look at things. So, Independence, Pensacola, and Arkansas, definitely. Saratoga, of course. I wouldn't mind LST 52 surviving. You said five, didn't you? That's, I think that's it. Independence, Arkansas. Trying to make it a song. Um, Pensacola, Saratoga, LST, 52. Yeah, that's five. But that's from the Able test, isn't it? Oh, good lord, there's more in, uh, there's more in Baker. Well, but, uh, Saratoga goes through both, so I'm just saying Saratoga, definitely. And Arkansas is in both, that's good. Um, do I want to save Nagato over the LST? Oh, good lord. Or do I save her instead of Arkansas? Because the Americans have lots of battleships surviving, they don't have... Oh, good lord, and they have an LSMM. Oh... Frigates! Um, and a floating dock. Oh, and some marines. Oh, that's cruel. Um, I think independent Saratoga have to be saved. Nagato and it's got to be the LST, because those were just so important, and we have nothing surviving. So, LST-52. Uh, but, oh, that's that's cruel. To make me figure through that one, that is cruel. That is evil to pick five from that. Not Prince Jürgen. I don't. I, I don't care, Prince Jürgen. I don't want Prince Jürgen. Um. I'm not. Don't take this the wrong way, but it's not going to be my top five. It's just not. Uh, 
Um, Sonic Mirror, what did... I'm not pronouncing that. Question, Night Secret, Night Secret for one. Question 16. Why would the Italians, Japanese, Americans not build 10-inch gun cruisers if there was no treaty? Because, as I've said before, the 10-inch gun is not a good gun. It's as heavy and slow to operate as a 12-inch, but doesn't offer a significant advantage over a 9.2-inch or 9.4-inch, and doesn't have the firepower of a 12-inch. So if you're going to go for a gun with that rate of fire, you're going to go for a 12-inch or a 14-inch. You're not going to go for a 10-inch. If you want to go for the higher rate of fire, you're going to drop down to a 9.2-inch. You are not going to go for something in between. Um, right about I read about the Type 64 destroyers uniforms more in a book of from book, book teams, but never after. Was there a top secret here? Type of, no. There's the counties, but they're not Type 64. The the others are Type 42. There's no Type 64 destroyer. In fact, yeah, there's. The type system for the Royal Navy, anything which was six, 61 to 68, is the aircraft direction frigates, which are the Salisbury class, which were type 61s. And um, I, they're type 61s. I, they are, I'm not sure, if, I think some of them might be using the Falklands. But no, I don't think none of them were using the Falklands. They were all sold long before the Falklands. They're all sold off in the 1970s. There is... The only Type 60s the RNs ever had are Type 61s, and they proposed the Type 62s, which that was never built. Um, type 80s are 81 Type 81 Trevor Class Frigates. Type 82 Destroyer, which was, of course, Atomus Bristol. And Type 83, which is planned, as successor Type 45. The, type 40, uh, the Types 41 to 60, the anti-aircraft frigate destroyers, were the Leopard Class, Type 41... Type 42 East Coast Frigate, the Type 42 Destroyer, which was a Sheffield class, then there's a Type 43 design, which was supposed to be improved, 42, Type 44, which was a small version of Type 43, but with better anti-submarine capability. So basically, they took the improved Type 42 Destroyer, which would be turned into Type 43, and decided to add, uh, make it slightly smaller, add better anti-submarine warfare capability, and created a Type 44, never entered, uh, never built, and then the Type 45s. Um... Let's see. What do we have? I'm going to expand this out for a second. While I look very, very grim. Let's see. Uh, no. There's no four. No, there's no 64s. Uh, type 24 is... A version of Type 23, supposed to be even cheaper for export. Never built. Um, type 16, or conversion of some of the T, O, and P class destroyers. They went around then. The type 21s were the Amazon class. Nope. No, Type 64. Sorry. Well, no, I swear to you, I read about it. I'm, you possibly did somewhere, but there wasn't a Type 64 in the Falklands War. Um, I don't think there's an Argentinian vessel which was called a Type 64. They don't have, they have some 42s, but no, they don't have 64s. Okay. I still haven't managed to get the books, but I haven't managed to complete the, get a, a catch up with the, the the questions yet. I will do get to the books once I've caught, caught up the questions. Um, 
Make sure. How about a custom sleeve for a side seam or not? How I have a four foot pillow myself for you mean for a large fluffy torpedo? Hmm, that's an idea. Robert Donut, since you spoiled my C-130 carrier fund, what do you think is the largest aircraft you could design that could routinely operate off a Nimitz or Ford? <sighs> routinely? Um... Let's see. I would say hmm. Would the C two nine five work? It's got a very wide wingspan. Potentially, the Sherpa, Sherpa is a sort of right size, that was short takeoff and landing. Probably used by the Army, US Army, but it, it was by Shaw Brothers and it could have been used. Um, I suppose there's the Thunder Pig. I would say you're looking at something small like. Maybe the C two nine five, etc. That could pro possibly be adapted, but that's got a very big wing stretch, a very big wingspan for it. But it is capable of stall. So basically, what you want to look at is what's the largest aircraft capable of stall, short takeoff and landing, because that's the easiest to adapt to carry operations, because that's the most similar to the stresses. Okay. Germans put autoloaders in their World War II 11 inch capital ships and managed to keep them that part secret. How does that affect their engagements and does that lead to Bismarck's having 12 11 inch guns? Uh, potentially and potentially, because if they have a sheer volume rate of fire that that could produce, especially if it's producing fast enough and reliable enough fire, uh, that could be a very useful system. It but also the thing is, if the Americans, if the Germans manage to do that, then honestly it's going to break in about five minutes because they're going to overcomplicate it. Even if they have a working system, you're going to need to literally put a shotgun to the head of every engineer and scientist and politician involved in that project and naval officer, everyone involved in that project from the beginning to the end and threaten to blast their brains to smithereen if they have one more cute idea. Um... It would be an absolute nightmare. It would be. Fun, but an absolute nightmare to bring about.
I said, the Type 64 is a Type 42 and Type 22 radar on pick duty. Oh, I remember some people made that joke. Yeah. Some people did make that joke. But usually it was called... Uh, oh, what was it called? It was not called... It was... There are various jokes made about it being a Type 64 and all sorts of different things, but there are a few other jokes, and one of them is more common. Oh, what is it that Michael uses? Michael has a definition of it. And it was actually a fairly good matchup when it worked well. When it didn't work well, things went to pot. When it worked well, it was a fairly good matchup. It's like all these things. When it works, it works. The trouble is, no one had really tested it prior to the Falklands War. And that's another problem you have. You know, if you haven't tested these things prior to war beginning, you're in trouble. Oof. Thanks, Night City, everyone, for answering, uh, for answering that question, though. Um, question 17 from Night City, everyone. Why do the media and the military not understand the phrase, be careful how you present things? Um, because it's not their job to worry about that. Uh, at your base point in a newspaper or in any form of media, your job is to inform. Okay? I accept that this channel is never going to be as big as some other channels. I accept that. I'd like it to grow, but I accept it's never going to be as big as some other channels. Because I view my position is rather like a university lecturer. In my view of what a university lecturer should be. I'm there to give you information to allow you to go and make your own decisions and your own information and make your own sort of uh, views on things but also to teach you how to not so much how to think but how to structure your thinking okay which is a different thing people often take that and they say well you're, you're trying to brainwash people and you're going no 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 the thing is what i'm trying to get and i try and i use nail history for this and en sometimes engineering history depending on the students i'm working with but I'm trying to get people to think in this, I'm put in the idea of going, okay, here is my question. Here is what I'm asking. First, this is the relevant information, the evidence. From that question, what is my quick assessment of what the answer to that question is going to be? From my quick viewing of that evidence. Okay, that is it. Then let's go examine that evidence in greater detail, do more reading. Does it continue to fit with my original answer? If not, do I need to change my answer? And it's an ongoing process of more reading and checking back. Is your answer still valid? Are you looking for information only to support your answer? Or are you considering external things? Because if all the evidence you're reading is entirely in according with your original answer, you have got a bias skewed research. There should at least be something which is arguing against it. Because there is no such thing as a universal historical opinion or a universal scientific fact. In that, is a, when I say universal scientific fact, I mean a universal scientific argument about the facts. There are often lots of facts out there. There are often lots of theories about it. And there is often going to be a dominant theory, which will have a lot of evidence and stuff supporting it. But there will be others as well. If all you're reading is one side, you're not reading around the subject properly. And... That's what a university lecture is that. And then it's to do. And they're, they're, used to, they're using the joy of naval history, the information that, to pass that on and pass that important history on. Because again, I said, those are the skills you're passing on to students, but also the knowledge you're passing on is the fact that these are the lessons which have been paid for in blood and we don't want them to be forgotten. We don't want people to have to learn and pay for them in more blood. So that's what you do. 
but you accept that if you're doing that, you're not going down the media route, which is always the media route is going to get you more attention and more views. The media route is always going to make you bigger. And the media route is what version of this is going to get the most clicks, going to get the most attention, sell the most papers. Because it's a base point, media is a business. And there is nothing wrong with that. They're in the business of selling information. And for them to sell information, they have to make it attractive to the buyer. Okay? So that's what they're doing. They are a very much... If, if, if you play Dungeons & Dragons, you will know about information brokers. And they are often a key part of the game. A, a source of where you can find out what's going on around you. Well, the thing is, an, in, in, an information broker is also part raconteur. They have to be able to tell a compelling story, so you listen to the information, so you want to come back. So they get a premium for the information they are selling. They want to sell both quality and story. Whereas, again, if you go to sort of my style, what am I looking for? I'm not looking to... well. I'd like you to take the information away and be happy with it, interest in it. But what I'm most looking forward to is looking for you to learn. I'm not looking to sell you information. I'm looking to sell you... A, well, if I'm going to use that phrase, looking to sell you an education, I suppose? No. I'm looking to sell you knowledge. Yeah. It's knowledge rather than information. That's how it's sort of it's supposed to be got through. Because it's information is when you get this is the data and this is one side of it. Knowledge is when you get this is the information and this is all the sides of it. Or as many of the sides of it as I know. And there's nothing wrong with that again, because again, as I point out on this channel quite regularly. I don't have any editor or anybody standing on my shoulder going, you can't spend 12 minutes talking about that. The public won't like it. No one will watch it. I go, no, I like it. I, I would love to spend 12 minutes. I was going to say, how many people, editors, would want me to sort of, uh, you know, talk using one of these? No. But I can, because it's all on me. So, it works. But again, 8829 was asking about the modified JDAM bomb used to cheaply uh, was, was mm, used to cheaply sink ships. Ah, well, yeah, that would that would certainly be added on. Modify uh, modifying a JDAM is con is a common thing they're gonna do. Uh, if it's available to them to buy, they'll do it. Nice one. Why did the British go for 18 inch for the aerial torpedoes and 21 inch for anti submarine and ship launch torpedoes? Um, well, they go for 18 inch because for starters that works with the air ministry, but also the 18 inch for the aerial torpedoes works with their idea to try and get maximum range from their torpedo bombers. Let's be honest, 21 inch torpedo is going to weigh more than 18 inch. It's going to pack a big punch, but it's going to weigh more. It's also another reason, again, you have to remember the British are going for that tension wire and all those various systems. I use my fluffy torpedo. You know, the tension wire on the end, the fins, everything to make the uh, make the torpedo belly flop. You go for a heavier 21-inch torpedo, it's even more likely to, and even more difficult to stop it doing that. So you go with the 18-inch, which is the an effective torpedo, but it's lighter and easier to balance. Just a tad. Not much easier, but easier enough it helps. And 21 inch for the submarine strip launch torpedoes? Well, you don't have to do the aerial drop. You don't have to worry about that. So you must well go for the harder, heavier hitting, longer range torpedo. Blackwing Maximus. Operation Tengo doesn't happen. Emoto survives the war. To be turned into a war memorial prize museum at Pearl Harbor. What would you like to find out about her that it was lost in record burnings? Her armor. 
Seriously, I would like to take that armor apart and look at it in the detail. I'd like to know how they made it so thick and whether it was actually, actually set on the inside or whether it was still slightly molten. I have a theory it might have been still been slightly molten, but we'll leave that, I'll leave that to one side. Uh, Paul Beswick, regarding the reloading of the VLS to see, to achieve this, do we need bigger ships than a new version of Mark 41 that can be reloaded from below decks, i.e. from the side and below? Um... Honestly, if you could have a Mark 41 that could be reloaded from below, that might work. That might work. But that's going to be complicated. I would say the other thing I have thought about, and I have suggested this, was that you need a Mark 41 which has railway tracks running along it. Let me explain. So instead of having a crane loading it in, you have a little almost chute mechanism. Robot comes along, picks out the chute, that the, uh, the, the, the box that the missile was loaded in from the VLS, dun dun, takes it off, maybe drops it over to sea, maybe drops it back in the magazine so it can be reloaded and reused later. Who knows? And then it reloads the uh, missile and insert, uh, reloads another one, so one from the magazine. It's all based on the Queen Elizabeth style system, the Queen Elizabeth carriers and their system. But instead, basically, instead of you trying to crane drop something, you have something which runs along and go and holds it in place and has rails. So you almost have a little railway running around the ship. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what they do. Leslie, that's very kind of you to say that. I, I find you provide enough information to make me want to read more. Uh, you are a teacher rather than a politician who pushed a view of the world. Yeah, the, the thing is... I have always found this strange, the idea that everyone should A, agree with everyone on everything. That would be incredibly boring. And B, the idea that I'm supposed to make my my students or talk to my students in such a way that makes them into clones of me, that would be incredibly disturbing. Out of that, it would be physically impossible the amount of hours I have with them. You know, it's just not going to happen. Uh, my turn. Do you think Drake from World of Warships is what might have been considered for the ships to replace the Hawkins class when they came up for replacement in the mid-1930s in a non-treaty setting? Mm, it's certainly along the lines of what I would think, I would think they'd be looking at. But in a non-treaty setting, things could have changed dramatically. Diamond Maximus. US Navy missile cruisers are based on the last class hull. What changes? They are a lot bigger. They are a lot bigger and a lot more powerful. And probably have bigger guns. They might not. They might not drop the eight-inch gun. They might still have. They might actually have continued on with the eight-inch gun and still have it around. In which case, the cruisers would be really, really useful. Well, basically, a crane is working on pivot and you control, and it's a lot of manual effort. Whereas, if you have a, 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 a basically a sort of carriage system which can carry the missile up vertically from the magazine and then on the railway take it round. And maybe have another system which takes it down sort of the other side, so basically it can do that, and it can go up and long sort of, and it holds itself using a caster wheel system. It would work. And it would lock in place as it loads down. So instead of being the crane and the movement of the ship, it would literally be locked onto the ship. So your only loading will be loading inside the ship and inside the magazine. Internal magazine. Uh, so I'm talking about an automated cassette system. Not really. I was thinking more kind of like the coal bunk, uh, coal bunkerage system on some of the G uh, GWR where they had systems whereby um, you'd have the the truck instead of was sort of locked wheels, and it could go in any sort of it could do that way or it could do that way, 
it could follow the track straight and it could also be taken up so basically the missiles would be stored down in the little carriages you'd have an empty one go first empty one would collect the missile uh, the VLS that you want to replace uh, the VLS the first VLS you want to replace dun -dun. maybe take it back down below and then the next one would come up and reload that and then that one is empty would pick up another one and you could do that along the whole system Five missiles. U.S. Navy missile cruisers are based on Alaska class hull. What changes? There you go. I said, question two. So why would the Royal Navy not try to get 49.2 inch, 15,500 ton cruisers when they need cruisers in non-treated sending as they need cruisers to make up for only having seven battle cruisers? Um, A, why do they only have seven battle cruisers in non-treated sending? Again, nice to go from one. You're falling into the trap that the British are only going to build the G3s and N3s because they're all they've, they've announced. As I explained to many people, the British don't announce at the same pace as everyone else. The Japanese announce their have their system planned out years in advance because they have very limited infrastructure. The Americans have to get theirs through Congress. So theirs all been agreed by Congress, various things, so they've got 16 ships. Everyone knows that. The British don't have that system. Think about it. When were the N3s and G3s announced? In basically the years they were ordered. So you have no idea what the British will have at that point. Now, I do agree the British are more likely going to be building a lot of them, but again, what do they, do they need? Do they need a 15,500 ton or do they need an 18,000 ton one? I'd say the British will probably be closer to 18,000 tons, especially once you consider what they're looking at, which is a global empire. So they want ships which are very self-sustaining. So that means they have to carry more in the, in the way of workshop space, more in the case... Uh, in the way of thing, uh, the ability to fix themselves at sea and maintain themselves at sea. If you ever walk around, if you walk around HMS Belfast, there's a good example. Of this. You walk through her, and you've got a lot of machine shop spaces, literally for maintaining the ship and maintaining all the equipment aboard the ship. That's part of what you're building the ship. You, the more, lo the more you're supposed to w operate around the world, the more of that stuff you're going to carry. Yeah, I think 3D mode, uh, 3D printers do can include systems, uh, so, so systems like that. How do you know the RM will go to fast battleships after the key class comes along? They could go to fast battleships after the Caracola class comes along, but again, if they've gone to fast battleships, how fast have they gone? Are they fast enough that they can fulfill some of the battle cruiser roles? Probably are. So again, you are putting things down as these are their battle cruisers. Well, they've got fast back capital ships. And that's the way those can fulfill some of the, some of the battle cruiser roles. Maybe not all of them, but they can fulfill, fulfill some of them. And that's before we consider, well, they might go, hang on, we prefer having a battle cruiser and a solid battleship. So they might have fast battleships which are 28 knots, but they might still want 35, 36 knot battle cruisers. Because again, Britain, Britain can justify that need around the world. The reality is you're dealing with a personality in 1927 of Admiral Madden. You're talking about a man who literally wanted at least 33 aircraft carriers in the fleet, and arguably it works out at 48. Who starts off with air groups which are very small, and by the time he's getting through the end of the paper, he's talking about air groups which are roughly 48 to 60 aircraft. And that's just one of several officers like him running around in the 1920s. You are limiting these people for logical reasons, but reasons based on an idea that they are still st they are stuck responding in a fixed way. And they're not. Because the first thing you have to realise when you're dealing with the British in the 1920s and 30s is they're still in the mindset they were pre-World War I, where they are, very sure, they are the big boys when it comes to the maritime and naval warfare, and they are setting the pace of development. So if anyone goes for a fast battleship, they'll get there first. But that fast battleship will set the tone of fast battleships. And doesn't mean they necessarily get rid of battlecruisers. 
take care, Paul. Because for or don't build more battle cruisers because that might well help them. They might interpret the keys as being super battle cruisers rather than fast battleships. That might be what they decide they are. Yes, there is a line merging, but it's not actually merging as much in the British forces as it is in the Mer as it is in the Germans. So again, you have to be careful with that one. The British tend to be upping both at the same time. So if they make their battleships into fast battleships, they might make their battle cruisers even more powerful. And the key class get built. The nicest way the British response to the key class will be in service long before the key class are. Again, the British have the infrastructure to do that. This is a point. This is another thing about conversing, conver about talking about the Britain versus the Americans. The Americans have to build a lot of their infrastructure to build their stuff. The British still have the infrastructure. That's one of the reasons why they can afford to not be going, we're going to build 16 or all these things, because no one has to build a yard to build a British battleship or battle cruiser. They have to upgrade some of them, but they don't have to build them. There's a big difference between upgrading and building them. Oh, Age of the Dun, Madden has plans. I know in the British Naval Aviation vi video, I showed one of his tables. And that's the biggest and clearest table, and it's one I used in my PhD thesis. But he has dozens of tables over the years that come up at various points, and he has big, big plans for his fleet and force structure. And it's based on basically generating free home fleet size forces. So the re I'm not being, I'm not being hard on Night Declare for one. I'm just, he's giving me these questions, so I'm responding. But the point is, you have to think through what those personalities are going to do. And, again, Verdun has pointed out the Congress might decide to cut the money long before. They'd already decide to cut the money before the treaty really goes through. Um, let's be honest, the pace of the Lexington construction, the pace of the South Dakotas, is nowhere near what it should be, if they were going to be completing that on the timetable. And one of the things people often think is they go, well, it's 16, they're building the six Lexingtons. So they go, well, yes, but look at those Lexingtons. Do the Lexingtons really count in a world with the G3s? No. Because they're a different ship. The Lexingtons are battle cruisers. And they're about for economic warfare and reconnaissance. They are very good ships for that. They're not good for fighting other battle cruisers. The British ones, Hood, definitely is on that level. And the G3s can probably take account for them. Renown Repulse, not too bad either. Um, but if you have books to recommend regarding naval history, there is a section in Discord which I think is to do with books, but if not, um, find the appropriate section on Discord for it, or send me a message if there's not, and I will add in a book recommendation section. Night 6831, um, okay. So his plan sounds too, Matter's plan sounds too ambitious to be doable and practical. There is no one better informed about the state of naval affairs in that period than probably Madden and BT and etc. They're the CNCs at a lot, but Madden's the CNC of the larger fleet, the largest fleet of the home fleet. He's working with everyone. If he thinks that's the... And he's also incredibly politically connected. There is a reason he ends up as first sea lord in 1927. So I would not discount what he says. And it's a very easy thing to do. But again, the British are not in the same situation after World War One. They are after World War Two. They can afford it. There is a major cut in defence spending after the Washington Naval Treaty goes through. And that affons other things which go on. But if that treaty hadn't gone through, and they just kept up the pace of spending, they could have afforded that.
Now, take it, everyone. Don't take this the wrong way, but whilst you're probably right with question 23, that's not really something which is for you to ask. There, that's personal information. That's not something I'm going to put in a video. Okay? It's just not. So what I do, if I, if I'm joining up, is what I do. Ban on grass bay with a more sane gun light. Six guns or six inch guns or eight inch guns. Probably eight inch guns. Dragon cruisers are built by uh, Lexington was a cruiser built by a government with a bloated runaway defense budget, which is why they later called the Alaska class heavy cruisers rather than the uh, the, uh, the U.S. Navy was still thinking about eighteen. Ooh. Um. I said, question one, what stops the Treasury from making the Royal Navy create the terminology designation of the heavy cruiser on the grounds of money? Uh, because the Treasury doesn't get involved in that sort of scenario. The Treasury has strong control of the purse strings. They always have. They always they are part of the government. They are, and that's their role. But they don't get enroll, involved in the creation of designations for other departments because that will be stepping into the role of coordinating other departments. Which would be a part of which would be a prime ministerial or cabinet office office role, and the one department which the treasury doesn't like to get into a uh, into a fight with is the cabinet officer and prime minister, because the prime minister can dismiss the chancellor, and that means the treasury is then put back to square one. Again, nice to go, everyone. The manpower are not issues. You have to remember how much manpower is cut in 1924. Um, basically, in... Yeah, the, 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 between 1920... The Geeds Axe falls in the mid-1920s. And it's pretty much 1923, 24 onwards. And yeah. It, it starts in various parts of the government and it's pushed forward by the Chancellor. But again, it can be done because of the Navy already being shrunk because of the Washington Treaty in post war scenario. If the Navy was keeping going and needed to keep up because the Americans and Japanese were building at the strength they were building at, the British would have funded it. Because the British aren't going to drop down because the other people want them to. At this point, Britain is not in the situation where it can afford to. If Britain's, and Britain's got maritime security as the, the, the key defense of its empire in the 1920s and 30s. And if that's sec not secured by treaty, it has to be secured by construction. And they will do that. Um, and last week, I seem to remember, Night Secret, when you asked me if in a war I would volunteer. And yes, but also in the nicest way, you wouldn't. Britain has conscription and national service. If there's a war, I'm below 45, fairly fit, fairly healthy, and I spend enough time in the gym, I should be fairly fit and fairly healthy. I know I'm a bit of a big tummy, but otherwise I'm okay. Yeah, I, I'm not getting out of that. So I think I said I'd volunteer first because I'd like to choose where I go. It's a sensible one. And I'm a naval historian and I study this enough to know what likely things are coming. Rob Dennett, what would the Royal Navy look like today with no Falklands War? A lot smaller. A lot smaller. I'm not sure if they'd even got the Queen Elizabeth class carriers. Um... How do you make the Deutschland class more adequate than they were? Make them even slower. Um, probably. That's pretty much what you can do. Take away their, their air search capability. Night 6 everyone. Question 24. What effect do you see on World War II if the Gloucester and Southampton Town class were the Edinburgh class subclass and the Edinburgh subclass was the 4 quadruple 6 inch class, uh, gun design? 
the Edinburgh subclass were actually supposed to have the four quadruple six inch guns. They did, the turrets weren't ready in time, so they went with the triples. And then war happened, so they just kept building triples, and that's Crown Colonies, etc. was war emergency menus. Um, but no, it's... it's uh, if they're all the bigger ships, then they're going to be more capable, and who knows, if they're more capable, then it might have made it quicker to get the quadruple six-inch guns and stuff. So they're more useful. They have a higher rate of... They have a higher volume of fire. Hello, Richards. Good afternoon, Doc. Hope you're well today. Question. How many ships were lost to Henschel HS-293 guided missiles? Woof, not that many. Um, let's see. Avskaban was damaged. Uh, Ugolini Vivaldi was scuttled after being damaged, so was lost to it, that's sort of one. Uh, Bush at Washington was lost during Operation Avalanche, again. Um, Delius damaged. Dovelton, a Hunt class destro escort destroyer, was damaged and uh, scuttled. So that's free. Uh, Eo Yale was sunk. And so was LCT 35, destroyed the same hit, so that's five. Um, Inglefield was sunk, that's six. Marshall is possibly a Fritz X and it's only damaged. Janus will not draw over HS-293, Fritz X or a torpedo, but we're going to count it, so that's seven. Damaged, damaged, damaged. LST-79, sunk. LST-282, sunk. So we're now up to nine. Lawford, sunk. Probably HS-293. Um... So ten. HMS Spartan, eleven, sunk of Anzio. And same with Harrington, sunk of Anzio, that's twelve. So twelve probably. I go to the gym five days a week. I give myself Saturday and Sunday off mainly because I need to. I spend Saturday and Sunday doing a lot of DIY at the moment as well, <laughs> and catching up on recording, which I missed from in the week. So yeah. Yeah, but there aren't that many HS two nine threes made, and there are also Fritz X's out there taking things, and sometimes aerial torpedoes. All sorts of fun things are going on there. Uh, Black Maximus. Uh, destroyers under the London Naval Treaty are set to 2,000 tons and 2,250 tons for destroyer leaders. What changes? Um... You you get turreted 4.7 inch guns. You get turreted 4.7 inch guns. That's, that's a big change. And you get more torpedoes. I mean... If you consider the 1949 Daring class are 2,830 tons in fully loaded, and that's with radars and all sorts of things added on, if you are taking off radars and all those systems, and all those automated systems, you can quite quickly drop down 500 tons. And you could be talking a Daring class equivalent tribal class destroyer. Um... Reply, Robert then, replace the Royal Navy with the United States Drone Navy during the Focus War. What does the American Task Force look like? Um, probably they'd bring at least one, maybe two of their carriers. They'd position themselves in a up threat task force, blocking with Hawkeyes and uh, F-14 Tomcats any ability of the Argentinian Air Force to or Navy to actually get anywhere near their operations because they have airborne early warning and F-14s to intercept. And basically, the air, it's the airborne early warning, which allow, which cues the F-14s to go and take out the targets. 
Um, Belgrano is sunk. Um, probably by submarine, but maybe by airstrike. And you probably have some L landing platform docks and L landing helicopter assaults arrive. They probably do a mass landing into Stanley because the Americans and the Argentinians both train on the Coupe de Man approach. And that's one of the reasons why the Argentinians are concentrated as they are because they believe the Royal Marines are going to do a Coupe de Man. And the Royal Marines have said do a... Um, well... what you can basically describe as a, a coup de foudre um, and land elsewhere and then move around and keep confusing them as they go. It's a it's a fun scenario. Uh, basically, you have a big fight, but the Americans with all the aerial power are going to win it. I say yes, but it's also not really any of your business. It might be what you feel is your personal view as what I would join, but there is a case of there is some information I don't give out. I never give names of my cousins. I never give my home address and all sorts of things because you don't give out these things on the internet. And again, I wouldn't with students at university. I wouldn't tell them what I was going to do in those sort of scenarios. Again, because, well, there's two reasons. One, uh, if then a kid goes and joins up because, it goes and joins the unit because I, I'm joining it, then that means they're joining, they could be joining because of me, and I don't want that responsibility. I want people to make their own decisions. And two, because um, that can be considered a form of recruitment. And again, that's not my. That's not what I do. I give people information, let them make decisions. I don't recruit. Don't need to. Um, Nick Richards, it's literally it's, it's the amount of production they have. It's their production. Um, Dark Master, the RNO is working with automatic 6-inch guns in 1937 of the level of Mark N5. It has working 6-inch guns in 1937 of the level of Mark N5. What different ship designs could come out? Does the 5.25 ever get produced? No. The If the 6-inch automatic is available and is able to do the profile that it does, does you don't need the 5.25-inch. Uh, I don't think Argentina would have a Navy or Air Force left. That's not the kind of going to be 52s. Look, if the buffs show up, there is nothing left after the buffs go through. You know that there is a song called When the Saints Go Marching Through, which a lot of people think is a good reason why the Royal Navy would have called their ships Saint Class in the 1920s. Unfortunately, it didn't reach Britain in that time or was in any way, shape, or form as popular as it become later in that time period. So, no, there would be no connection between a song which no one knew and what the Royal Navy would do as a procurement. But leaving that to one side, and as I've got into that discussion over the G-freeze and N-freeze and what their namings would be, far too many times that I'm not going to get into it now. But leaving that, uh, leaving that all to one side, uh, there is an adaptation of, that of When the Buffs Go Flying Through. And it is a rollicking good song, but it is also quite scary and quite true. What if the USN fleet proportion set was equal to the RN? Then you have about nine aircraft carriers showing up. Good luck. And all the forces with them. Hey, on. I know the Barcelona use against the Houthis yet, although the B1s have. 
The B ones are having fun. When the buffs show up, it's really serious. Yeah, Richards, that's the problem. England isn't Catholic and saint names. And also the fact is that um, they're, they're someone went, well, you know, it's the patron saints of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. And I went, well, Ireland is going independent. 1917, all sorts of the things at this point. So uh, 1917, 1919, 1921, all these things. They are, they're gone. Um, you're not going to do a patron saint of Northern Ireland because the group that let's say in there are the ones who are definitely not Catholic. And whilst they probably do believe in saints, do not really like It's Max of Popery to them. Um, then you've got the fact that Britain has never really named warships for the English, for the Welsh and the Scottish patron saints at all. They've been a couple of ships over the years, but they were far back in the age of sail. And even St. George is rare enough that, frankly, it's a big occasion. And it's usually not a battleship. So, uh, yeah, no. Uh, nice one. Question 25. What free changes would you make, make to the RNS through Cruiser Force truly terrifying? When? We're talking about in World War II, uh, prior to World War II, 9.2 inch guns would really work, as would mm, high pressure steam turbines like the Americans are fitting, and adding 4 inch armor plate to everything. And being able to do so. Like you did with the, uh, the counties. Um. Paul Beswick, is it true to say that Britain had more infrastructure pre-World War I than it did immediately pre-World War II? That's what I was They have more infrastructure prior to World War II, prior to World War I. They have a lot more infrastructure after World War I than they do prior to World War II. They have more infrastructure after World War I than they have after World War II in terms of naval maritime infrastructure. The British have a humongous amount of a maritime infrastructure. In fact, you can argue they have more infrastructure prior to World War One than they do after World War Two in the immediate aftermath. That is the sheer quantity of maritime infrastructure you have. This is another point to think about when we're talking about the 1920s and the British making orders. The reason the British don't need to start planning these orders and advances, they don't need people to invest in yards which don't exist. The yards do exist and they keep working and they presume they're going to. They, they, they're presuming they're going to. I'm not saying it's smart and the right decision, but that's what they're presuming. And they have enough competition going on that they can get them for a healthy price. As I've said before, the G3s, pound for pound, are probably the most cost-effective and most value for money, and probably possibly fire in terms of value to cost the cheapest capital ships the British had built or were planning on building when they were ordering them. Because you have to remember there's about a dozen yards competing for four ships and that drives the price down low. It really does. Yeah, I think the the, 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 the suns that turn up are battles. What if the Argentine government blew up the American embassy and sometimes they during the invasion of American positions? Good luck, the buffs are inbound. Bannon, what European Navy would you say made the best of it after World War II? Any navies you think deserve some focus in particular? Italian. They do really quite well. French are always there. British do not too badly after World War II, let's be honest. Um, but Italians... Long term, the Italians have done really well. Now, Bang Masters, all county class are replaced on 1959 September 3rd with Des Moines class cruisers. 
they're modified to the same number of torpedoes as the candies. What happens? Well, with the Moyen class, the Royal Navy goes happy days. Um, the thing they might have trouble with... And I'm just checking... Air defense, air defense, air defense, air defense, air defense. The thing they're going to have trouble with is supplying the 5 inch 38. They can supply the 8 inch because the shell's not quite right, but they can actually adapt them to fit. 5 inch 38s and the 3 inch they've got, gu uh, they've got guns for and they've got Oricon 20mm so they can do that. So it's going to be the 5 inch 38s they're going to have the trouble with. That, that's their main panic is going to be what happens when we run out of 5 inch rounds. Um, so that's your main problem. They remember have four inch and four point seven. They have four inch running around. They don't have the five inch thirty eight. So that that's going to be the British issue. It's going to be the five inch thirty eight supplying them with ammunition. Otherwise, they're going to be perfectly happy with them. They can adapt to use those quite happily. Let's be honest, if the British suddenly have those replacing all the County and Hawkins class, then the Royal Navy's very, very happy, because all the Hawkins are gone, but also they have 12 of a design which are built post-World War Two and about 70,500 tons. Those things are going to bushwhack anything they come across in World War Two in the cruiser categories. It replaces all the... It replaces Exeter and York as well, then they're really, really happy. <laughs> and I said, a nice security one. Could the USN have built a Baltimore class size cruiser in the early 1920s if the British built a 9.2 inch gun cruiser? Mm. Uh, I don't see why not. They could have done. They could have done. Well, there's nothing there too massive that they couldn't have done and they didn't use facilities they had for. Happy birthday to the floppy research assistant, uh, Stafford. Convincible class operate F-35s, Robert Dunnett. Um, well, in theory you can from something that size, but you're not going to operate that many. It's not got as much space. If the, the Moles Revenge, hello, if the Royal Navy had built an additional place to the Travel Class Destroyers, what would they have been named? I've got a list somewhere. I, would, I have to go hunt it down, but I have got a list somewhere of what their other names. Come on, uh, Cartoon Man, 154. Watched the Type 26 video the other day. It brought me to the channel. I'm guessing that subject of the Queen Elizabeth Carrier having an issue has been covered. Uh, that question was asked, and basically I pointed out that this is the trouble of only having two ships. And also, it's like this. In World War II, the Royal Navy had HMS Eagle slightly damaged. And they kept using her and kept using her and kept using her. And then when it came to Taranto, they were down to just illustrious, because Eagle had had a, major issue, had a major issue turn up. And nowadays, they go to policy of, well, if the other thing is available and we have a minor issue, let's fix the minor issue before it turns into a major issue and just use the other one. So that's more sensible. But this is also why you have free ships. And also, because if you consider HMS Queen Elizabeth's maintenance, etc., was had effect, was impacted when Prince of Wales had her issues. So, this is the problem of having two ships. You have no slack in the system for the availability, and this is why really you need four or, four or five aviation ships. So I keep saying three LHDs with F-35 capability and would make it far more sensible, because then you have a pool of five ships, which three which were amphibious for primary, but could operate as a as a limited carrier facility, and two which could be a, were a, were strike carrier capability primary and limited amphibious capability, and you then get then if there was an issue you could go right then okay well we need to cover for that that needs to go into maintenance that needs to go into that's in maintenance, so that will have to be rolled as that with that tailored air group and that will have to go and do that, and that's what you do. You have a you have a need a bigger pool of ships, and this is what medium powers need to think about. This is the whole thing of getting into the whole LHD Queen aircraft carrier all sorts of those scenarios. If you want to be a sensible medium power, you need to think through what you have and what that viability is for them to cover each other's roles. 
So you're being replaced. How does you know what go? Um, Crete. It's it's very different, but uh, it's it does all sorts of interesting operations if York's replaced. But let's think about what happens if Exodus replaced, and the battle of uh, the battle of River Plate. Let's be honest. If Exeter is replaced with a Des Moines class, then goodness gracious me, there are going to be a lot of very unhappy people. Especially when you consider what the Des Moines class actually carried. Because the Des Moines, and when you've got them, they carry Mark 16 guns. And the Mark 16 are uh, an interesting system. That's the self-loading system. They had a very nice rate of fire and had maximum elevation of 41 degrees. So had a range of roughly 17 miles or 27 kilometers. That's, um, that's going to have an impact on you. That's really going to have an impact. And also, you means you're going from six guns to nine guns for York and Exeter. So you've got a 50% increase in firepower for them. And for all the other, or all the other counties, you've gone from eight to nine. Uh, I've spoken to the clerk of a modified evolved Trieste class Yeah, that would be perfect. That would fit very well. My second question number 27. Were the US really going to limit of their docks with the Lexington and 1920s to South Dakotas? They were certainly getting there. And certainly the limits of being able to support them were enough dockyards. But they were going to build more, so that was okay. Again, that's part of the expense of building these ships. You build more. And especially depending on which coast you're on, whether they're actually, they could have supported it. Could have changed Java Sea? Mm, probably. Let's be honest, that's a long-range fire capability. And again, the Des Moines class, that long-range fire capability comes with improved radar. And the British have radar in 1939, so you would give them the radars. And the fire controls, and the PPIs, all those things with the Des Moines class, that's going to change the Java Sea. It's going to turn it into a massacre for the Japanese. If you have that capability of radar and that capability of range of guns, you can literally, and the British would do this, could pick your targets at range and smash them. Um... Nice turn. Why are the British World War Two twenty-one inch torpedoes heavier and larger than the U.S. World War Two twenty-one inch torpedoes? Because of wanted the, what they wanted to put in them and how they wanted to power them, and also because of some of the testing they'd done, which had revealed that they should put certain things in them and do certain things in certain ways. Nice turn. The Moin class against Grass Bay. Grass Bay is on fire from stem to stem for about twenty minutes and can't shoot back, so it's scuttled off, being really ineffective by the Royal Navy. Yeah, pretty much. And also, imagine how quickly that tech gets transferred into other ships and copied. Imagine how quickly the British would transfer that tech around. They'd literally be screeching over backwards to do so. Mark Agnes, hand-waving politics aside, pretend that in 1940 the Royal Navy are handed an IOU allowing them to borrow an American carrier for six months. Which one do they want, and what do they do with that? Oh, which one do they want? In 1940. Oh. Let's see what's actually available to operate in 1940. Uh, for them to operate for six months. And when I say op actually available for them to operate, i.e. available for them to operate. Uh, da -da -da -da. In 1940... Um, Langley, definitely not. Mm, sunk in 1942. Yeah. Uh, Lexington is in service. Saratoga's in service. Uh, Ranger, Yorktown, Enterprise. 
So it's Ranger, Yorktown, Enterprise, Saratoga, and Lexington. Now, as much as I love the Lexingtons, and I do love their high tops, their top speed, I think the Royal Navy might want a Yorktown class, and I have a reason for this. If they have to pick for Americans, none of them really fit the British criteria, but the Yorktown comes closest to what the Ark Royal provides, and if you're going to really support the Ark Royal in Force H for six months and maybe give it some time to get it um, repaired if it needs to in and do things you probably want to use a Yorktown to back up Force H. Because let's be honest, Force H could, a Yorktown could work with Force H. So that means I have to pick between Yorktown and Enterprise. Um, which do I want? Uh, okay, chat. I'm going, I'm going to do something for you all. I'm going to do something for you all in the chat. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly go back to the live chat. And I'm going to uh, engage your audience and start a poll. Which Yorktown? So, which... Uh, uh, I'm going to be starting this. This is going on for a while. Going back to the uh, going back to the questions, right down to the bottom. Right, handling politics. Enterprise is getting a lot of early votes. Enterprise really is getting a lot of votes. I do love this system sometimes. It's logged me out of the chat on one of my uh, one of my screens. Oh, that's annoying. That is annoying. So, I'm going to be ending the vote in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I'm going to wait till that appears on stream to end, actually end the vote. I am going to do, wait till that appears on stream. Ending poll. And the results are supposed to flash up here. They are supposed to flash up. Go back to live chat. 88% Enterprise and then present Yorktown. So yes, it's USS Enterprise. Dr. Clark, please assume your Enterprise of luck continues. What kind of exploit could you get up to? Um, honestly, with her plot armor... I don't need to do plot armor on this thing, but I would say with her, with Enterprise and for, with for operating with Force H, I don't see her getting part in Taranto, but let's be honest, with Enterprise operating around Force H in 1940, uh, well... Uh, 
what you none of you have thought about is that Merz El Kambir is historically carried out with HMS Ark Royal. Imagine if you've got Yorktown as well as Ark Royal there to back uh, to carry out Merz El Kambir. Does Dunkirk get away? Does anything get away? Um, nothing probably gets away. In nicest way. The odds are the French get uh, Mazar Kabir do not have a cease, uh, cease to become a problem, and I think that could make things worse for the French in some ways, but better in other ways. And probably the attacks on Genoa have far more teeth, and you've got some real problems for Bismarck, etc., when they come out. In fact, the thing is, uh, the more interesting thing is, of course, you've got the carrier. You probably have the air group is probably supplied, possibly supplied by the British. Or fitted out with at least British aircraft so they can fake their British carrier. Which is going to be interesting. A swordfish could definitely operate from the uh, from Yorktown class. So it could Albacore. Um be interesting if they brought a load a whole load they'd probably be asked to bring a whole load of fighters with them. Uh, nineteen forty The F4 Wildcat is introduced into service in 1940, so December 1940. So it's probably it's probably its predecessor at this point. And which means probably it's the Buffalo. Oh, that could be interesting. It could well be the buffalo, which is uh, brought across. They could have a whole load of buffaloes brought across with them. Which, again, 1940, not the greatest aircraft, but would certainly be an interesting thing to have turn up for operations. So, yes, yeah, so how much fun would it be? Uh, there'd be all sorts of things going on. The other thing would be, what do the British do for Taranto? And one of the things you could have is you could have them split up. You could have Yorktown launching strikes in one place, and... Ark Royal could race down to launch strikes in Taranto, so you could have the Illustrious launching a strike from one direction in Taranto, and Ark Royal launching a strike from another direction, or even mixing up. There's all sorts of little, little options they could do around that. You could even do Yorktown and you know, uh, Yorktown and Ark Royal. And the reason, only reason I'm saying you'd probably mix the air groups up and have British air group take over is because of night flying operations. You'd have to modify Yorktown to British, to British standards for night flying, and you wouldn't have time to train up an American crew to the, the, the full air group to night flying standards. It would be an integrated mixed crew to get it up, to, to try and get up to standards in time. So, yeah, it would be interesting. It would be interesting to see what happened. So, where were we here? I was there. With the Great Depression, how would the French be compared... Without the Great Depression, how uh, were fair or worse in World War II? With the Great Depression... Um, without the Great Depression, they would probably have been still in as bad a position as they were, because they still had the political issues. And the political issues for them were the overriding problem, because the politics was, but we don't trust their own armed forces. That's not really useful. Um, no, there's a reason I put Enterprise with Force 8 rather than Mediterranean Fleet. And that is because Enterprise would work best with Force H, with the ability to mobilise into the Atlantic and into the Mediterranean. With that range, she'd be really useful. And... Honestly, then you'd also wouldn't have the problem which Jamie Seadell of Armored Carriers likes to point out, and is true, that they didn't have any coverage for Ark Royal, so she didn't get the maintenance she needed. You could have done quite a lot of maintenance of her, even in Gibraltar. You could have done something. And the, frankly, they couldn't do as much as they wanted because they didn't have another aircraft carrier to cover her. You have Yorktown there, you have another aircraft carrier, you can swap them in and out. Adam, assuming the Royal Navy contro kept control of the fleet arm in 1920, would the RAF adopt a FAA plane designs, or would it turn out more like it did in real life? Um, ooh, that could be really interesting on the fighter profiles, because the fighter, the, the, British, the Royal Navy would have really pushed forward fighter profiles, dramatically, because their dependence upon fighters for their air defense and their outer air defense. So you could end up very much with whatever fighters you have available in 1939 they would be very much naval inspired at least naval technology push forward aircraft
That's kind of, that's kind of like saying that what's the wrong response to Churchill getting phone call saying, we have an American general turn up with what he says is the entire US Navy Reserve Fleet of 1949. Please advise on the day he returns to the Amity. Or no, no, no. Assume uh, Enterprise sh shows up back to the Pacific Fleet in late 1949. What lessons does she br bring to the USN? A lot of, control, of fighter control lessons. The Americans have great fighter tactics. They don't have great fighter control systems in place in terms of their structures and organization. Um, their focus on the Alpha Strike, on the Big Strike, has meant they've sort of neglected some of the defensive aspects. And the British focus on these things being the smaller constant strike system and the constant air defense system and the constant things in daytime. Because the British always thought the Alpha Strike was a nighttime routine when you risk it all when the enemy can't really attack back. And during daytime they want to do small strikes and they want to use exploit cloud cover and all sorts of things. Um, so there's a sort of different philosophy there. Um, the Americans are very much a big wing. The British are very much a, we go with what we have. Because the Brit uh, because both of them are dealing with the fact that you can have a carrier orientated one way or the other way under the treaty system because of the tonnage limitations. The moment you have a treaty, you have the treaty limitations go away, and you can build a carrier as big as you like, and you don't have to worry about the tonnage limitations or the cumulative tonnage limitations. Especially, you can uh, have a carrier which can do both without any trouble. It's fun. Um. Paul Essex, so the interwar naval treaties would have started the decline of shipbuilding. Yeah. Massively so. And they caused the depression to be far worse in the UK than it needed to be. Because if you consider what was the traditional British government thing to do when there was an economic downturn? Order ships. Because it employs everyone. If you think about it, if you're building a ship if you're building ships, who, who does it employ? Well, it employs all the trades which go into the ships. It employs all the people producing uh, producing steel, all the people who are producing wood, all the people producing all sorts of raw materials. Are uh, it's employed there, employing all their companies, refineries, and all those things. It's employing a load of researchers and developers. It's employing all the people who provide food for those people, who provide beer and other services for them. It's a great way of actually running an employment scheme without running an employment scheme. Building ships are far more, because of the range of things that goes into a ship, it's far, a ship is far more beneficial to the wider economy than, let's say, building aircraft. Because aircraft don't usually have a lot of toilets in them. Aircraft don't have a lot of showers in them. Aircraft don't have a lot of hotel facilities in them for the crew. Which means you can spread that out around other, other, other sort of systems. You've also you've got quite so many trades, it builds into so many different areas of defense. Of procurement. Right, it's very nearly four hours, so I'm going to answer the rest of the questions, but please, no new questions. And then I'm going to go in, because it's now half eleven, and I am conscious that because of various issues, I was working very late for the last three nights in a row, and I wake the dogs up when I go in. Which is another reason I'm looking forward to my new office, because I won't have to worry about that. Take care, Leslie Mitchell. Enjoy. Excellent. So basically, the Yarra marchers were right. Bill more ships was the solution to the Russian. Yep. Dracon, I've seen some economic studies that say the Washington Naval Treaty caused the Great Depression. It certainly took a key element out of the economies. And it's kind of like a longer term impact version of what the Americans do to the British economy post World War II when they switch off. Um, when they switch off the finance, uh, the uh, I don't know, lend lease in immediately, instead of doing it phase bit over time. I will enjoy in pups always. So let's see. All right, don't worry, Black Mountain. I worked out it was a Great Depression. Uh, nice to everyone. for everyone. Uh, question for everyone. Are there any German ships that are victims of the problem that plagues the Admiral? Other German ships? There are lots of problems. Which are... All the German ships basically share the same problems of being overly complicated and designed by committee. Definitely according to the Corgi. The Poodle doesn't mind as long as I pat him when I go in, but the Corgi does definitely have a bedtime and doesn't like to be disturbed and will complain about it and then require a hug and a carry around the house while the poodle goes in the garden so that he can feel like he's getting his, his, his you know, proper compensation. 
Richards, and in all the history of warfare from minds to tanks to blitzkrieg tactics to jet aircraft, the side with the technological advantage wins as a rule. Are you concerned about what we haven't seen? Um, it's not always the tech advantage side which wins. Or rather, people sometimes take it as the tech advantage is having the best equipment. No, it's having the best fit, uh, the, uh, the best fit equipment. Okay, so let's put it this way: you can design the absolute amazing world's best artillery system, but if you only have six of them, and the people you are taking on have sixty of an artillery system which is Let's say only 90% is good. But a lot cheaper and easier to build. The odds are they're going to win. So if you look at some of the tech in World War II, one of the reasons why people often get obsessed with the German system is they look at them and go, but this is technologically the best system. On paper, it's amazing. Actually try to operate the thing. Actually try to operate... Actually try to use it, maintain it, keep it in our in combat. Oh frigate, it don't work. Let's be honest, compared to the Sherman, pretty much every other tank being produced in the same period was slightly more advanced. But the thing was, the Sherman was advanced in one key area. It was very easy to repair, very easy to replace, and very easy to maintain. And don't, don't, I, its advanced it just was in its design and construction. That's where it's advanced. And that means you can churn out oodles of them. And you can keep them going. And that is what gives them the advantage. Because when they are fighting a tiger. Oh yes, we've got a tiger. We are so worth any 10 of your tanks. That's fine. We've brought 40. Good luck. And you may be, and maybe the tiger, if it's lucky, gets 3 or 4 before it gets taken out. Because it's dealing with a sheer weight of numbers. Yet, you put the two next to each other. Anyone, no one's going to sit there and go to Sherman. Oh, the Sherman's technologically the best the best equipment there. Because the trouble is, in our, te in our view of technology, we often have a skewed view that it's got to be the absolute amazing piece of technology. And no, it has to be the uh, effective technology. That's the difference. So that's simply the answer. Uh, do you question, when will the MAD develop the MIRV type in the Intercontinental until ballistic missile, a ballistic garden shed? Why would we want to give away our advantage? Night to go through one. Uh, question 42. Did the British make the mistake that the plagues the Amarillo class on endpoint? Um, I would argue York, HMS York and, 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 and Exeter have issues. They have issues. The Cut Prowse counties have issues. Yeah, and Russian versus rocket art, German art, rocket artillery systems. That's another good example, Colin. There's, there's lots of arguments about it. Um, but honest, without Churchill's interference in the RN shipbuilding, would the RN have settled on building a lot of implacable class, like the USMD Essex, or continue on building improved classes? Probably continue building improved classes, no, Brush. Because if you consider, by the time you need volume of carriers, that's when you're against the Japanese and looking at the Pacific. And that's going to be not 1939, that's not going to be 1940, that's not going to be 1941, it's going to be 1942. And by that point, they've already got the Implacables in service and probably working on their next one, next generation. So they've probably got next generation or in construction. So it's going to be, if they do order volume, it's going to be the ones after the Implacables. It's going to be the Audaciouses or their equivalents. Um, no, it can be said the animal class battlecruisers are a case of British not knowing what they want but how true would you rate that uh, they know exactly what they want when they order them it's just they change their mind halfway through so it's not a case of them not knowing what they want it's they know what they want when they order them and then they change their mind when they're going through when they're building them it happens because new evidence comes to light and they want to make them viable for the world they now see it as 
not the viable. Uh, it was vi made viable for the world they saw it as to uh, saw it to be, and then when their view of the world changed, they wanted to make it viable for that new cha for that changing world. Night to Terry everyone. If the Germans had taken a step back and looked at the Admiral Hippers, what do you think? They, what do you think they really was the problem? They had a problem. Nope. Because they're so good on paper. Um, Night to Terry everyone. Are the question forty five? Are there any American ships other than Lexington class that suffers from the problem of the Admiral Hippers? Lexingtons don't really suffer from the problems of the uh, Hippers. I would say the pro the American ones that suffer from similar problems of the Hippers are probably Pensacolas and Northamptons. Which have similar issues of they are perfect on paper for their mission. The trouble is their mission doesn't relate to reality. Um, when the British were designing cruisers, was the question of what they are for the first question asked? Yes and no. To the extent they knew what the cruiser, what they always knew what a cruiser was for. The question was not so much what are we building, what, what are we building this cruiser for, but what are we building this cruiser to? Because they know what a cruiser is for. They have a plan in their mind. It's kind of like why I was very happy when the Type 26 stopped being a global combat ship and started being a frigate. You know what you're building to. And it's the big problem I had with the, in the, uh, with the literal combat ships, again, because they didn't know what they were building to. They had this whole new concept and no one really worked out what it was. Anyway, thank you very much, and I'm ending the Q&A. So... Thank you very much for watching. Thank you everyone who's been here. Thank you Dick Richards, Burdan, Jigger Petchingland, Knights of everyone, Colin Cameron. Thank you everyone who's been here. Thank you all for all the questions. No one wants German high pressure boilers. No one does. Thank you DG40, Steve Clark. Thank you everyone. Um, I would do a longer thank you for everyone, but it is now nearly 20 to midnight. So I'm just going to say thank you all. Thank you to everyone who supported the channel. Thank you to everyone who's starting to enter, put in um, entries for the competition to win the books. It's very kind of you. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel in all the ways you do. Whether that's liking the videos, watching the videos, sharing the videos, all the buttons down there. Or Kofi, patron, memberships of the channel, all those things. Thank you very much. As I've said before in a couple of videos recently... They're one of the reasons why I am absolutely committed, even through moving house and all these things, to keep the channel going at the rate it has been going, is because, honestly, I miss you all. Which is kind of strange to admit. It does it does make me worry about a, a, the significant level of parasocial relationship going on here. But it is the thing I would miss this interaction. It's a big part of the fun part of the naval history of my life. Because being a naval historian is kind of solo. You spend a lot of your time on your own, with computer screens, with books, with archive materials, reading, 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 thinking, reading, reading, thinking, reading, noting down, and not really talking and communicating with anyone. Which is why lecturing and being part of a university is so much fun. The thing is, I'm a contract lecturer, and at the moment, I'm, and let's be honest, while moving house, I can't really service those contracts. They're, the unis are fine with it. They're happy with it. They're not. They're, they understand, and they're going to. They're basically saying, "Yeah, go on, come back when it's over," and that's fine. But without that level, it would get incredibly lonely for me, especially up here, because I enjoy your questions because they make me think about things. It's like the questions which came through the other day about Madam's paper, and I realised the phraseology he'd used. And he continued on, and it started off as a phraseology which he's talking about the uh, the force. And people thought, well, was that maybe he's talking about the this, this is the cumulative aircraft from multiple carriers? And I realised from reading through the paper it wasn't. But the thing is, that table heading comes from earlier on. That's a pro forma table which had started out as talking about the number of aircraft put on capital ships and cruisers on battleships, battle cruisers and, ca and cruisers. And so it that's why it uses that phraseology. And then it gets to carriers, and then it's presumed everyone knows what he's talking about, that the carrier's going to take that whole air group. And if you're just looking at a table without all the writing around it, you don't know that. And it's, it was interesting to think about. Anyway. Competition. Yes, there's a competition. There's a link down below, and it's to win. There are two copies of the of the new edition of the Tribal Battles and Daring's, the second edition, the paperback. 
um, available to be won. They will come personalised. And I hope you'll enjoy it. There's a whole video linked down below which explains the competition. Anyway, thank you very much, Sharon. Take care, and yeah, that's a lot of fun. Toodles. Let's see, I think it's that button.